Better? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thanks very much for having me. Sorry, I'm not up there at the podium. I'm way over here to your right, sort of. Uh, also to your south. All right. Um, yeah, so thank you very much to Liam for the great introduction and uh, to Liam and Isaac and everybody involved in having me here tonight. For all of you guys for showing up, I appreciate it very much. Uh, the topic of my uh, discussion tonight will be my plan to shrink DFW airport. I hope that uh, you're not disappointed with the bait and switch. See, the problem with that airport is it's way too damn big. And uh, they scheduled my layover to last about 10 minutes, but it took me about 20 to get around the track in that tram thing to get to my connecting flight and the door was closed. And it says in the rules, that once the door is closed, the door is closed, even though the plane was literally sitting right there for 15 minutes while I was finding out that there was no way in hell I was going to be able to get to Montana in time to give this speech tonight. So I could see the plane the whole time that we were negotiating my ticket back to Austin. So I'm really sorry about that, guys, but it's everybody else's fault but mine. I swear I didn't even stop for a Dr. Pepper or anything, which, by the way, they don't even have Dr. Pepper at DFW Airport. It's all Mr. Pibb in every single machine. So explain to me that in Texas. Uh, they got real problems there at the DFW. It's not just American Airlines. It's also in the vending machines now, too, everybody. Okay, now you guys want to talk about the war, probably. Okay, here's the deal with the war. It's mostly Bill Clinton's fault. Now, the thing of it is this. The actual invasion of Ukraine by Russia it's the responsibility of Vladimir Putin and every man in his chain of command that follows his orders. Nobody's confused about that. And for the next, as long as this takes me, although I'm going to try to give you guys the quick version here, um, none of my arguments that I'm making here are meant to justify what Putin did or to truly diffuse the responsibility away from those who've done what they've done. They're literally killing people right now. And, um, you know, Look, as an American, my job is to oppose American intervention. You know, we could, uh, I could focus on, um, you know, Chinese brutality in Tibet, or I could focus on sexist violence in India, but my focus is on the crimes of my government. And so, for example, I do focus much more on what happens to the Palestinians compared to what happens to the Tibetans because my government is in large measure responsible for Israel's treatment of the Palestinians. And so it's not that I care more about the Palestinians as human beings than I care about Tibetans. It's just that there's something that at least on the margin I can do about what's happening to the Palestinians because it's my government, supposedly a representative government that is helping the Israelis do what they're doing. So. You know, that's my disclaimer, so nobody misunderstands. I'm an American, I'm a Texan, which is even better than that. And I've never even been to the old world. I've only been to Vancouver and to Nuevo Laredo. And I guess, oh no, I went to Cancun one time on a boat. Does that count? Uh, not really. So I'm an American and I'm a patriot and I care about my country. I don't give a damn about Vladimir Putin any more than frankly, I give a damn about Saddam Hussein or Muammar Gaddafi or Bashar al-Assad or the Ayatollah Khamenei or Kim Jong-un or any other foreign leader that I'm put in the position of having to defend simply because what my government is saying is a lie. And uh, that happens a lot. You guys have probably noticed in your own life. Um, and a lot of times it's just a lie by omission. But, you know, as we all learn, even when we're little kids, I don't know if you guys are all too young for Matlock and Perry Mason, but when I was a kid, it was a really big deal on TV that you have to swear to tell the whole truth because a partial truth can be just as misleading as an outright lie. And so, you know, context is everything. And so that's why I'm here is to tell you what's really going on in the world, which is that, yes, this war is all Russia's fault, but it's happening within the context of the new Cold War that is all America's fault. And by that, I mean, Bill Clinton and W. Bush and Barack Obama and Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And by Joe Biden, I mean all along for the last 25 years, they have made bad decisions 
when it comes to what America's foreign policy should be. That doesn't implicate you and your mom and your dad. It doesn't implicate all the land between San Diego and Bangor. It just means that, guess what? Bill Clinton and W. Bush and Barack Obama and Donald Trump and Joe Biden made some bad decisions, which I know does not sound that far-fetched to you guys. Are we on the same page to start here? Okay, today's the anniversary of when Bill Clinton sent the Delta Force to kill the Branch Davidians, okay? This is a guy who made bad decisions sometimes. He's the same guy who bombed Iraq from bases in Saudi Arabia for eight years straight, leading directly to the attack on our towers and the entire war on terrorism we fought for the last 20 years. Okay, well, he also had a lousy Eastern European policy. And it started with breaking George Bush Sr.'s promise to Mikhail Gorbachev, the dictator of the Soviet Union, that if he would withdraw his military forces from all of Eastern Europe, all the way back behind Russian lines, and allow the Warsaw Pact states to go free, and allow the reunification of Germany, that America would not extend our military alliance NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, as they put it, one inch east. Now, they tried to quibble about that and say, no, we only meant whether we're going to move NATO east within Germany. Well, we weren't talking about moving east of Germany. Yeah, come on, that's not true. And it's all in writing. And you can look at the George Washington University National Security Archive online. They have it all. It's called What Gorbachev Heard. And you can read all about it. And they swore that they would not extend our military alliance. And you have to understand that this is, you know, in this period, 1998 through the end of 1991, in the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Soviet Union, that the commies did not have to let Eastern Europe go. Gorbachev made a choice to not send in the tanks and crush the independence movements. The commies had previously done exactly that in Hungary in 56, in um, Czechoslovakia in 68, in they threatened to in Poland in 1980 and 81. The, the people of the Eastern European states want to be free of Moscow. They get killed. They get crushed. But in this period of time, they did not. Gorbachev decided, ah, what the hell? Let them go. And part of the reason for that, okay, the preponderance of the reason for that is because on the other side of the game they were playing was H.W. Bush. And H.W. Bush was playing it smart and cool instead of being a jerk. As he put it, he could have gone and tap danced on the Berlin Wall and said, ha ha, you commies, we beat you and rub their face in it. But he didn't want to do that. In fact, H.W. Bush literally was a sportsman. He would played ball uh, in school and apparently like had learned the lesson about how you treat a defeated opponent and he didn't do that. And in fact, this is embarrassing history, but it's true, folks. H.W. Bush tried to save the Soviet Union. Now, not all of it, not the entire Warsaw Pact and all the commie states of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, but the so-called Soviet republics, which meant the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. And it also meant Belarus and Ukraine. And in August of 1991, H.W. Bush went to Kiev and he gave a speech to their central committee where it was later called the Chicken Kiev speech. And he warned them not to declare independence from Moscow and said, if you do, America will not support you. And if you're gonna declare independence from Moscow, you should do it on a timetable determined by the Kremlin, not by you. And we will not intervene and we do not. And by the way, this line was written for him by Condoleezza Rice, uh, wrote this speech, um, the Soviet expert, supposedly. And, and he said uh, very harsh words. He said, um, we will not uh, 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 you know, help you, I forgot, abet you, if you choose to trade a far off tyranny for a local despotism. And there's a big difference between freedom and tyranny, uh, freedom and independence. And freedom is what is important. Independence might have to come later. He was trying to hold the USSR together. Now, I'm not saying that that was the right thing to do, but I'm saying there's two important things that we can learn from this, okay? Which by the way, 
they voted to declare independence three weeks later and it stuck. And the Soviet Union was absolutely 100% all the way dead and gone by Christmas day, 1991. The red flag came down, the red, white, and blue flag came up. The USSR was dead and gone and there was only Russia, uh, the Russian Federation and the former now independent republics in its place. So H.W. Bush's effort there did not work, thank goodness, and the Soviet Union did fall apart. But what's important here is two things. The first thing was that, well, I forgot what the first thing was going to be, but the second thing is that uh, Bush Sr. was very concerned about the danger of ethnic nationalism in Ukraine. He warned them explicitly in his speech against the danger of ethnic nationalism. Now, the thing is, as you guys probably know, Bush Sr. had been the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, and he must have been aware that the CIA had backed very far right ethnic Ukrainian forces in Ukraine uh, through the whole Cold War, through much of the Cold War anyway, especially in the 1950s, but off and on really through the whole Cold War. Well, and when I say very far right forces, we're talking about the people who fought on the side of Hitler and the Nazis in World War II, who, you know, when the Nazis came, there was a lot of these people thought of them as liberators to come and save them from the commies. The commies, of course, had starved millions of Ukrainians to death in the 1930s when Joseph Stalin just simply stole all of their grain. And, you know, your sociology professor probably won't teach you that, but it's called the Holodomor. And it goes to show that the commies were as violent as the Nazis before the Nazis were even the Nazis uh, or before they ever had a chance to act in the same sort of fashion. Um, but anyway, so there were people who were happy to have the Nazis come and save them from the Soviets and even fought on their side in the war. But then, of course, the commies won the war and the Germans were forced out. But these became the core of the stay behind forces that the CIA supported. So Bush Sr. must have known this and was worried that there could be a civil war break out and that this would, you know, halt the progress we were making in ending the Cold War. So that's what it was that he was so worried about there. Um, oh, and it also another point, I'm not sure if this was the second thing I was going to say, but here's the second thing, was it was part of him being a good sport and playing it cool in the way that he was cooperating with the Russians at that time that allowed the Soviet Union to fall apart. If he'd been rubbing it in their face and tap dancing on their grave, then that would have bolstered reactionary forces inside the government who were determined to uphold the Soviet dictatorship. So at that point, um, the way that he played his hand was very smart. And by the way, look, I mean, Bush Sr. is the guy who heralded the new world order where everyone on earth, as he put it, what we say goes. We are America's now the world empire and we're going to war in the Middle East and we're staying there. And we've been at war in the Middle East ever since then, 30 years straight. So screw him. However, all other things being equal, though, you got to recognize the fact that Bush Sr., Ronald Reagan, too, but especially Bush Sr., they negotiated a reduction of nuclear weapons, thermonuclear weapons, on the part of America and the USSR by the hundreds of thousands. I mean, pardon me, the tens of thousands. They had as many as 40,000 nukes, and we had 30-something thousand. And Bush Sr. signed treaty after treaty after treaty with Gorbachev and then with his successor, Yeltsin, including in January of 1993, when he was the lamest of lame ducks, he still went and took one more trip to Russia to sign one more nuclear treaty and uh, reduce, ended up reducing nuclear weapons down to their current levels, which is about 6,000 each. The Soviets or the Russians have a few uh, more than us, but it's roughly about 6,000 each, about 2,500 deployed and the rest in inventory. Uh, but anyway, so that was probably the greatest thing anybody ever did. You know, um, you know, all other things being equal in getting rid of all of those nukes. Um, although the 6,000 that we have left is still enough to kill everybody a hundred times over. So what the hell? But anyway, I'm taking too long. I'm going to go faster now. Bill Clinton comes in. He breaks the promise. Why does he do it? First of all, he does it for the Lockheed money. And it's just as absolute clear fact. You can find this in the New York Times and all over the place. Great stories written up about this. A guy named Bruce Jackson from Lockheed Martin Marietta spent millions of Lockheed dollars on the Committee for NATO Expansion. And the whole thing was just a racket. It was just to sign up all these Eastern European countries, beginning with uh, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland, 
and get them to sign up to buy a bunch of Lockheed products. Now that you're in NATO, you've got to standardize your military. And if you can't afford an F-16, don't worry, the American people will buy them for you. And so that was the deal. It always was. By the way, this same guy, Jackson, bankrolled the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq back at, in the same time period and in the period leading up to the war uh, 19 years ago. Um, so uh, that was a huge part of it. Another huge part of it was Polish votes, especially in Illinois, but in other Midwestern states, uh, were thought necessary for winning re-election for the Democrats in the elections of 1996 and 1998. And so this was a huge part of um, you know, their lobbies in America, the Polish lobby, especially. I don't know if the Hungarians really had much of a lobby, but there's a bit of a Polish lobby by then. And there are a lot of Americans of Polish descent who were kind of rallied uh, to support this. And it was thought at least, I don't know if it really made the difference or not, but it was thought by the Democrats to make the difference. So just like in Justin Raimondo's theory of libertarian realism here, this had nothing really to do with protecting Poland from anyone. Poland wasn't being threatened by anyone, nor was the Czech Republic, nor was Hungary being threatened. Why do we need to bring them into our military alliance? And here's the thing of it virtually all of the most important graybeard, so-called foreign policy establishment leaders were opposed to this. Now, Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski did support it, but there were so many more who opposed it. And Susan Eisenhower, the president's granddaughter, organized an open letter signed by 50 of the most prominent foreign policy experts in America, plucked from all of the top shelf of the Council on Foreign Relations, including George Kennan, who had invented the containment policy for the Cold War in the early 19, uh, in the mid 1940s after, the, after World War II. His rival, Paul Nitsa, who wanted rollback of the Soviet Union, you know, the guy that wrote NSC 68 that really inaugurated the American world empire. Uh, if you guys don't know about NSC 68, your college needs to do a better job. Now, uh, then you had Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense for LBJ during Vietnam. And in the movie Fog of War, confesses to war crimes in, Korea, in Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. He's personally responsible for the deaths of at least hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. This guy, one of the worst and bloodiest hawks in American history. And on and on scores, and including admirals and four-star generals, and including the entire consensus of, as they put it at the time, the Defense Department and the State Department were all opposed. They did not want to do this. This was not the American, even the foreign policy blob establishment, this self-licking ice cream cone of government job holders and, and you know think tank grant recipients. Even they were like, man, we should not be doing this. It wasn't just gravy train. They were putting strategy first. And they were saying, this is a bad idea. You know what, if we're gonna bring, um, in fact, Bill Clinton's Secretary of Defense, William Perry, said, if we're gonna bring Poland and, and Hungary into NATO, we should bring Russia in first. Then that way, we're making it where it's just this common security architecture for all of Europe. And we're not pitting anyone against each other here. We're not leaving the Russians on the outside of the line between the ins and the outs as Jack Matlock, the, um, the uh, second to last ambassador to the Soviet Union put it. So when I tell you that this entire foreign policy, virtually the entire foreign policy establishment consensus was against it, it was for one reason and one reason only. This will be an unnecessary antagonism against the Russians. This will provoke them into reacting against us. They weren't saying this is a waste of money. You know, that's what Ron Paul might have said, although he had better and more principled reasons than that even, right? But that was not their case. Their case was, geez, how is this gonna look to the Russians? We start incorporating all their former allies into our military alliance. And the answer from the Clintonites at the time was, ah, come on, it's barely a military alliance at all, right? Nobody's threatening Poland, so Poland doesn't need defending. What we're really doing is we're just spreading peace and security and stability. We're making it so that one, we'll get rid of a lot of Lockheed products and two, we'll collect a lot of Polish votes. But three, we'll make it so that Slovakia and Slovenia and Hungary and the 
and and the Czech Republic and Poland and Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia, they'll never get into a war again with each other. I mean, as everybody knows, all these borders are drawn in the quote unquote wrong places if you're trying to go by strict ethnicity, which of course doesn't exist, right? But what we did at the end of World War II with the UN Charter was we said we freeze all these borders in place. And if we're gonna change these borders, not through war, we have to change them through negotiation and negotiated settlement and the rule of law. We're not gonna have wars. So what they said was, look, it's not that Slovakia and Slovenia are about to go to war, but if we integrate them into our military alliance, now they basically can't. That's like saying, you know, uh, Texas and, and, um, and uh, Louisiana or Oklahoma are gonna go to war. Well, we can't do that because all of our armed forces are integrated in the Union Army, right? In the National Army. It just, the, the first day of fighting could never even break out, right? It's preempted by our national government's monopoly on military force here. Well, any government powerful enough to keep the peace between the 50 states is powerful enough to try it everywhere in the world. And so that's essentially their argument, is that if they just bring more and more and more countries into their so-called security umbrella, then no one will ever mess with those countries because then they'd be messing with us. And so if the, in other words, if the biggest bully in town is America a really nice guy who's no bully at all? Well, he'll just keep all the bullies away and no one will ever bully anyone ever again. The problem is, of course, as we can see right now, what happens when your bluff gets called? What would happen right now if Vladimir Putin invaded Lithuania or, Lat or Latvia or Estonia? They're now members of NATO. We would be pledged to go to war on their behalf. And yet, as you guys all know, we have no ability to field a land army in far Eastern Europe. We call it the Baltics because we don't even call that Eastern Europe. That's east of what we call Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is Poland, dude. These guys are on the far side of there. On, you look at Ukraine, they're on the far side of Slovenia, which is on the far side of Austria, which was neutral in the old Cold War. And we keep moving our line from halfway across Europe, further and further east, now we're right on Russia's border, 1,200 miles further east than where it was in the old Cold War. The reason Stalin kept all that land after World War II was why? As a cushion, right? As a buffer zone. If the West is going to invade Russia, they're going to have to get through Poland and Ukraine and Latvia and Lithuania and Belarus first, right? Now, as Putin has complained explicitly for the last generation straight, and Yeltsin and even Gorbachev before him, we are expanding our military capability right up into their former sphere of influence in a way that makes them extremely nervous. As they say, you keep giving us these assurances up, up to and including last December, these assurances that NATO is a defensive alliance. We don't mean you any harm. And yet, as the Russians put it, yeah, but look what it looks like to us. It's still a military alliance that you keep moving right up to our doorstep. Your assurances are only so good in the face of the actual facts on the ground. You know, sort of like the Israelis promising there's going to be an independent Palestinian state one day. While the facts on the ground say their independent Palestinian state is covered with Israeli settlements. How are they ever gonna have an independent state? The facts on the ground overwhelm the narrative. At, at some point, the narrative has to give. This doesn't look like just a defensive alliance. It looks like maybe something a little bit worse. So real quick to wrap up Clinton, he also sent the Harvard boys to completely destroy Russia's economy and they did it on purpose. And I'll tell you in other countries in Eastern Europe, the so-called shock therapy worked. They said, look, we're gonna take all your nationalized commie industries and we're just gonna privatize them to, to um, the people at large and or to investors. We're gonna enforce a regime of private property rights in the courts and you're gonna have free market economies more or less, you know, American style quasi free markets, right? Uh, and it worked in, in most of Eastern Europe. But in Russia, that wasn't the scam. In Russia, shock therapy meant just electrocute the patient to death on the bed and, and pretend that you're trying to treat him. And, and, and one of the guys who was involved in the plan, two of them, uh, a guy named David Goldman and another guy named Jeffrey Sachs, 
they both admitted that it was on purpose. Not that they did it on purpose, but that they finally realized that this is on purpose. We're destroying Russia's economy on purpose. We're kicking them while they're down instead of being a good sport. And, and essentially what they did was they literally, I mean, not even essentially, they quite literally turned the entire economy over to seven men, seven throat cutting gangster murderer criminals. And these guys just became the top oligarchs in Russia. And it was so bad that the guys who had saved Russia from the commies were gonna lose the election of 1996 to the commies. And so what did Bill Clinton do? He sent in billions of dollars to rig that election, to stuff the ballot boxes, to bribe votes all over the place, and to rig that election to keep Yeltsin in power. Well, Yeltsin, guess what? He's the one who hired Vladimir Putin and eventually essentially retired early and turned the government over to Vladimir Putin in 1999. Um, that was a big part, you know, his entire rise to power there. Uh, uh, and he also fought two wars in the Balkans against Serbia. The first one was, it was more of like a peacekeeping operation, you know, mopping up after, but it was definitely choosing against the Serb side in Bosnia. And then in the Kosovo war of 1999, which was based on a hoax, absolute hoax that a hundred thousand innocent people had been murdered and that we had to go stop a genocide from taking place. Uh, they launched another war of aggression. Now, again, you're the Russians, the Americans swore to you that we're not gonna expand NATO East. And then they just started expanding NATO East. Now they lied to us and our parents about this, but if you're the Russians, you were in the room. You know that they lied to you. This was the lie they told to you. Then they said, don't worry, don't worry. It's a defensive alliance, a defensive alliance. And then what do they do? They start an aggressive war against Serbia. Now, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, that was at least against the UN charter. He had crossed an internationally recognized border into another UN sovereign nation state, you know, UN member sovereign nation state, et cetera. But Kosovo was a civil war. Kosovo belonged to Serbia, it was part of Serbia. Serbian civilization actually comes from there first. And yes, it was more dominated by ethnic Albanians at that point, but still you're talking about a civil war within a sovereign nation. And Bill Clinton decided, oh, well, forget the UN, I don't need them. We'll just have NATO launch the war to take the side of the, Kos the Kosovars. But who was they? It was the Kosovo Liberation Army, which was a bunch of Mujahideen bin Ladenite terrorists. Although luckily they were a smaller faction in the KLA uh, because it was mostly dominated simply by criminals, by drug dealers. And I swear this is true. You can look it up and all the UN uh, and EU courts have looked into this and prosecuted people for it. Organ harvesters. That is, they knock you out and they steal your spleen or your kidneys and sell them on the black market. That's the guys who ran the Kosovo government that we, you know, uh, that Bill Clinton's regime created there. And then this is the worst one of all, and I can prove it. It's in the book coming out, but you guys can find it if you look hard enough online yourselves. Bill Clinton and the CIA worked with the Saudis to back the terrorists in Chechnya. At, I don't know about in the first war, but definitely in the second Chechen war of 1999, 2000. Again, this is how Vladimir Putin came to power. Yeltsin put him in charge. Yeltsin, who Bill Clinton rigged the election in 96 for, put Putin in charge of fighting the war against the Chechens, a war that the CIA was back in the terrorist side of. And in fact, after September 11th, Bill Clinton and two of his Democratic allies, Tom Lantos and Brad Sherman, both from the House of Representatives, all three of them said something like, geez, I can't believe these Muslims attacked us after everything we've done for them lately. Even though they were still bombing Iraq from bases in Saudi, they were still supporting the apartheid state in Israel, which was also killing Lebanese at that time, occupying Lebanon at that time. They're still supporting all the kings and dictators of the Middle East and all the other things that were motivating Al Qaeda to attack us. But it was true. They were blurting the quiet part out loud that they had been backing. When they said the Muslims, they meant the bin Ladenite terrorists. They meant the guys left over from Ronald Reagan's jihad in Afghanistan in the 1980s who Bill Clinton continued to use throughout the 1990s, even though they were attacking us all through the 1990s. And in, in Putin's declaration of war in February, he said, I know that you guys backed the terrorists against us in Chechnya. You think I've forgotten that? And the thing is, that sounds like some crazy Alex Jones crap, but it's not. It's absolutely true that the CIA, in fact, the Washington Post ran a whole thing about uh, exposing the Saudi role, but the Saudis are just the CIA anyway. And if you look up at Stratfor, 
you know, I actually thought this was in the WikiLeaks. Funny anecdote. A guy called me out on Twitter. Hey, man, you said it was in the Strat 4 leaks on WikiLeaks that they backed the Chechen terrorists, but I can't find that anywhere. And I'm like, oh, no, I know I didn't get a footnote wrong. And I went digging through WikiLeaks through the Strat 4 emails and I couldn't find it. And I was going crazy. I was like, what is going on here? I know that's in there. I know I didn't get that wrong. And then, you know what I did is I just took WikiLeaks out of my search terms. There it is on Stratfor's website. It wasn't in the leak. It's right there on their website. This whole giant in-depth story all about it. And there was this other guy who ran, um, he was the head investigator for a congressional committee um, whose name I forget, I'm sorry, off the top of my head here, but it's in the new book coming out, who wrote this giant expose about this, explaining in detail about covert support for the Chechen terrorists during that time. In fact, one more anecdote. You guys remember that Colleen Rowley was the whistleblower from 9-11. She was an FBI lawyer and her team in Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota, had identified this guy, Zacharias Musawi, who wanted to learn how to take off planes, or sorry, who wanted to learn how to fly planes, but he wasn't too interested in how to take them off or land them. And the people at the flight school were concerned about this and turned him into the FBI. And the FBI agents in Minneapolis, they went to Red Alert, DEFCON 1, and they did everything they could to get Washington, D.C. to give them authority to search this guy's computer. And um, they wouldn't get it. They couldn't get it. And Colleen Rowley later wrote about it. You can read it at consortiumnews.com. You guys can still hear me, right? Yeah. Everything good? Yeah. Okay. Um, Colleen Rowley wrote it about it at consortiumnews.com. One of the FBI's arguments for why we want to search this guy's computer is they said, we think he's a terrorist tied to the Bin Ladenites because his brother is a Bin Ladenite terrorist in Chechnya. And you know what FBI headquarters said? They said, we like the Bin Ladenite terrorists in Chechnya. So that's not a good enough reason to search Musawi's computer. And if they had searched his computer, it would have led directly to the rest of the 9-11 hijackers in Florida at that time. They would have wrapped up at least two out of three or three out of four of those hijackings because the San Diego team might have still been out there somewhere. But they, they definitely could have, because when they did open his computer after September 11th, it traced directly to the rest of the hijackers in Florida. And the reason, again, the reason they were turned down is because FBI headquarters said, no, we like the Bin Ladenite terrorists in Chechnya. That won't get you a Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act warrant because the terrorists are fighting on our side there, right? Just like Hillary and Jake Sullivan talking about the terrorists in Syria. AQ is on our side in this one. And they think they're so cheeky and cute and smart, these Democrats, but they're not. They keep getting people killed. Uh, anyway, so then W. Bush comes in. Boy, you thought Bill Clinton was bad at being a president. Jesus Christ. Sorry, I know Easter was just yesterday, uh, two days ago. Um, the, this guy, W. Bush, so Bush comes in. First of all, he expands NATO by like nine members. He brings in, uh, he brings in the Baltic states. He brings in, I think, Bosnia and Croatia and Slovakia and Slovenia. He's going on. He also, oh, and you should know this about W. Bush, okay? On September 11th, Vladimir Putin was the first president in the, in the world, the first foreign leader to call W. Bush and say, I am your humble servant, anything you need. Now, remember, America was the one switching sides in the war in Afghanistan, not Russia. So he said, you want to invade Afghanistan? Be my guest. Literally, you can use Russian airspace. This is the president of Russia telling the president of the United States of America, you can use our airspace to invade Afghanistan. Telling him, you can use our former bases in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. I'll call them next and let them know I've just volunteered their bases for your efforts. And he had to face down right-wing opposition in his own government and in the military to do this. People in, in Putin's military said, you are insane. And Putin said, screw you, I'm the strong man around here, I decide, and I think it's worth it to try to make friends with the Americans right now. <laughs> yeah, idiot. So anyway, two months later, George Bush tears up the anti-ballistic missile treaty. Now, this treaty, was, I think, invented by Eisenhower and finally ratified during Richard Nixon, who had been his vice president, who finally became president and ushered it through. 
And this promise that we won't make anti-missile missiles because it's just escalatory. You know, they have a certain number of missiles. So we make a certain number of anti-missile missiles, assuming they work, which they really don't, but just pretend they work for the sake of argument. In fact, if you're the other side, you have to pretend they work. You have to pretend they work for the sake of argument. So they just make more missiles. It makes the whole argument moot. It's just a brinksmanship escalatory thing. So when they were trying to cap the number of overall deployed nukes, they said, let's go ahead and, and agree to not make anti-missile missiles either because then we'll just start breaking our caps and making more missiles. So this treaty was perfectly good and it lasted all the way to, through 2001. And W. Bush thanks Putin for his generosity by tearing the damn thing up. Now, it's not just that he was tearing up a treaty. It's that this meant then that he was building up America's ability, at least supposed ability, to shoot down incoming Russian nukes. Now, again, this is simply escalatory. That was the reason for the treaty in the first place. Class, if Vladimir, if you're Vladimir Putin and Bush tears up the anti-ballistic missile treaty and announces that he's putting anti-missile missiles in uh, Alaska and in uh, Northern Europe, then what do you do? You make more missiles. And that's, of course, exactly what Vladimir Putin did. And we didn't get to find out until 2018, where he gave one hell of a scary state of the nation speech, they call it, where he announced that we have a new, uh, first of all, uh, about a year prior, they announced this new heavy uh, rocket that carries enough multiple entry uh, warhead vehicles where one missile could kill every major city in Texas, uh, which is a lot, which is, you know, El Paso and San Angelo and Abilene and Lubbock and Dallas and Fort Worth and Waco and Austin and San Antonio and Corpus Christi and Galveston and Houston and Port Arthur. And I'm only like halfway done. Okay. One missile can kill my entire home state. Okay. And believe me, yours too. You guys are right in line of fire with your Minutemen everywhere. In fact, you guys are part of what's called the nuclear sponge. Did you know that? Just like our guys running around Afghanistan called themselves, oh, I'm a bullet sponge. My job is to get shot at. Yeah, great strategy. Anyway, you guys in Montana, you are the nuclear sponge. You are meant to absorb hydrogen bomb strikes. You are meant, the reason there are Minutemen missiles throughout your landscape is to draw Russian fire to you and away from the coasts where the important people live. And all of the nuclear strategists have said, uh, this is unnecessary. We don't need this. We shouldn't have land-based missiles at all. It's too dangerous to have them. We should have uh, only, uh, you know, uh, air delivered, you know, airplane delivered uh, missiles and bombs and or submarine uh, missiles. We do not need uh, the triad, only a dyad. But the other side argues, nope, we have to keep those Minutemen missiles deployed all throughout Colorado and Nebraska, the Dakotas, Wyoming and Montana so that you guys can be the nuclear sponge to absorb the brunt of Russia's assault against the United States if we ever start a nuclear war with them. Isn't that a nice little anecdote? I promise this is gonna be the short version tonight, sorry. Um, so now here's the thing. When W. Bush, oh, I, I, and let me finish with the nukes. So then Putin says he's got this new heavy nuke uh, he has another one that's designed to go around the South Pole where we have no defenses whatsoever, but has, you know, a bit longer range. And then in the cartoon, they showed it hitting South Florida, where Trump lived. This was 2018 when they did the presentation. They claim to have a new nuclear powered torpedo. So it's essentially silent and carries a thermonuclear warhead to destroy, uh, you know, any major port city or naval port of America's throughout the world. Um, and they also claim to have a nuclear powered cruise missile, which has essentially unlimited range. They claim could fly around the world 10 times if they wanted to kind of thing, which means they can sneak around any defense that you've got and take out any target. And then uh, last but not least are the hypersonic missiles, which Putin claimed. And I don't know if this is an exaggeration or not, but they claimed that they have hypersonics that, and this is in 2018, that can break Mach 10. And that means that a missile like that fired from the mid-Atlantic would get to Washington DC in about five minutes, giving them essentially no time at all to uh, decide what to do. 
instead of the very nice cushion of 15 or 30 minutes to decide what to do if the radars say there are incoming nukes. Are you gonna take one on the chin or are you gonna go ahead and kill all of mankind? You have now, you have you know three and a half minutes to figure it out uh, is the result of those hypersonics being deployed. So that's the result of W. Bush. And now W. Bush's government, they knew that they were lying. They knew that anti-missile missiles don't work. You can't hit a bullet with a bullet. We're talking about ice cold missiles coming in from outer space and you're supposed to hit them with a, a heat seeking missile when it's just a ballistic it's not a, it's not a rocket it doesn't have a hot engine on the back of it it's a ballistic missile falling from space um and the only way you can take those out is with nukes in space you shoot h bombs up there to to blow up incoming nukes anything short of that is a joke um so um but it has the appearance to the russians it might work and it might destroy their ability to threaten us with mutually assured destruction if we were ever to attack them. And so then that just means they had to build up their forces, which is exactly what they did. Uh, another thing that Bush did was, oh, oh, and also, sorry, it's important to note, and this keeps coming up over and over and over again in, in uh, Putin and Lavrov's statements, that in Romania and Poland, they have installed these anti-missile missiles, but they're launched from the MK-41 missile launcher. And that is a dual use missile launcher that can be used to fire Tomahawk cruise missiles, which can be tipped with hydrogen bombs. And so these are in Poland, and I don't know if you guys have a map in the room there, or if you understand just how close this is, but this is you know just a few hundred miles from Moscow. And so, you know, flight times, it's certainly within range of Tomahawk missiles and, and you know, flight times in, you know, the low tens of minutes. Um, and there's also a little strip of land between, and this is one of the things that when W. Bush did this, you know, Pat Buchanan explicitly warned against this in 1999 in his book, A Republic, Not an Empire. He says, if you bring the Baltic states into NATO, you know what you're going to do? Do you even realize it? And do you guys think the U.S. Senate even realize there's this tiny little enclave called Kaliningrad, which is between Poland and Latvia? It's owned by Russia. It's covered in military bases. So this little strip of Russian territory between the Baltics and Poland is now, from the Russian point of view, behind NATO lines, which is just crazy that we would even, when we didn't have to do that, we did that. And, uh, and that's as the situation remains. And, and just, you know, the other day, Putin threatened to deploy nuclear weapons there if America brings Sweden and Norway into NATO, as they have now asked to do in response to this war. Uh, so this is a major flashpoint. I mean, did you guys realize that if Russian troops in this little strip of land called Kaliningrad get into a skirmish with Polish troops, that that could be World War III, breaking out 5,000 miles east of Washington, D.C., fighting over a line that you and I and we all know is not the slightest bit of our damn business, could get essentially all of humanity killed. You know, any real war with Russia will devolve into a general nuclear war. And that'll kill hundreds of millions of us in the first week, but it'll kill billions and billions in the years to come, uh, in the you know few years following with the nuclear winter. And they've gained this out over and over again. You just can't have that many cities and that many forests on fire all at the same time. You end up with so much soot in the stratosphere where it's above the clouds, where it cannot be rained out. It's enough to drop global temperatures by, you know, multiple degrees. I don't know exactly, but more than five, enough to destroy crops planet wide, to starve humanity right out of existence. In fact, we're seeing right now how much of the world is fed from Russian and Ukrainian grain alone. Um, and, and the consequences there. If there's, if there's a war, uh, a, an H-bomb war in Europe and Russia and the United States, which would involve Canada as well, I mean, you're talking about the bread baskets of the world being directly involved in the war. All the rest of the crops on earth, you know, going under as well, going fallow as well. I mean, hell, that's just the icing on the cake. You're talking about billions starving in the event of a real war.
with Russia. And, and that's, you know, when Clinton and Albright and Bush and Rice and these people signed us up for this, they act like, no, nah, it's all good. This is essentially a cocktail party circuit. When we expand NATO, that's like expanding the EU. What harm could come of it? Again, it's not an anti-Russian alliance. We swear it's just a defensive alliance. So even if we extend it all the way up against this, that, or the other guy's border, it's not meant to be a threat and it's their fault if they take it that way. And so, you know, they write themselves this permission slip that everyone has to see the world through their eyes too. And that they swear that this is a defensive alliance. But you know, <clears throat> back in the Clinton years when they were warning against it, George Kennan, who had been, again, the guy that invented the containment policy in the 1940s against the Soviet Union. In the 1990s, he warned against this in the harshest terms. He said this would be a historical mistake on the grandest scale of the, the worst choices uh, made by American leaders ever in our history, this kind of language. And he said, I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. The Russians are going to react. And then all the people who are now, all the NATO expanders who are now telling us that they won't and it'll be fine, will all say, see, we told you, that's just how the Russians are. And that's why we need our NATO alliance. It's because of how they are. And then he said, that is just wrong. You know, and so in fact, to me, like that just is scientific and falsifiable almost, you know, in terms of political science, which is a soft science. But here is George Kennan, the American most educated about Russian foreign policy, probably out of anyone saying, and, and for that matter, expert on American foreign policy as well, saying, we're going to provoke them. And then all the people now who are saying, don't worry, this won't provoke them, will say, see, that's why we have to do this to protect from their aggression. When it's not aggression, it's their response to y'all's you know, poorly thought out policies. And that's what we're really living through right now is exactly his prediction. So it rings real hollow when they go, no, -uh, that had nothing to do with it. When all of our brightest minds predicted exactly what was going to happen. And then that is now exactly what is happening. Um, now, um, the other thing that uh, Bush did, uh, Bush Jr. here um, was the color coded revolutions. Now this started under Bill Clinton, but W. Bush really picked it up. And uh, under Clinton, they had tried, first of all, they just did a coup in Azerbaijan, but then they did these fake revolutions. You know, it's a coup d'etat disguised as an uprising, basically. Um, and they did it in uh, Serbia in 2000, in Georgia in 2003 with the so-called Rose Revolution that put Mikhail Shakashvili in power there. Um, they tried with the so-called Denim Revolution in Belarus in 2005 and the Cedar Revolution in in Lebanon in 2005, they succeeded for a short time in uh, Kyrgyzstan in 2005, but then that guy ended up being overthrown just a few months later again, I think. Uh, that lasted maybe half a year or something like that. Um, but this goes right to the whole argument that look, it's just a defensive alliance and we really don't mean you any harm and all we're trying to do is just get along. Well, then how come they violently overthrow in these CIA and NED operations, that's National Endowment for Democracy uh, operations, any government in Russia's near abroad that's friendly to them and their interests. Um, and including, you could chalk up a part of the motivation for Obama's dirty war against the Assad regime in Syria as for being anti-Russian motivations in the first place as well. as their you know, second warm water port, their only uh, Mediterranean port there on Syria's coast. And so, um, again, from the Russian point of view, all the assurances in the world that none of this is directed against you are ringing pretty hollow when we're on, you know, the fourth and fifth revolution, sixth, seventh revolution going on around here. And that includes two in Ukraine, one under W. Bush, the Orange Revolution in 2004. And then they did it again 10 years later under Barack Obama in 2014. We'll get back to that in just one second. But again, uh, looking at that from the Russians' point of view, um, this constant uh, series of revolutions in their near abroad, obviously they take that with the height of seriousness. Um, and now um, the all important year 2008, Bush's last year in office. On February the 1st, 
our current CIA director, William Burns, who was then ambassador to Russia, wrote a memo to Condoleezza Rice called Nyet Means Nyet. And what he says is he just sat down and he met with Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, and they had this nice talk. And Lavrov, of course, is the height of diplomatic uh, politeness. But reading between the lines there, not even very deeply, but just take a good look at it. Nyet means Nyet is right. Lavrov is essentially a threatening war. He is saying we can not and we will not allow you to bring Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. He said, this is our brightest of red lines. Mr. Burns, please understand me. Please believe me. Please tell the bosses back home that we would really appreciate it if you would not put us in this situation. If you start bringing Ukraine into NATO, that could cause a civil war in Ukraine one which we would then have to choose whether or not to intervene in. And we don't want that. So please just don't do that, okay? And Burns, I have to say, you know, I don't know exactly his motivation when he wrote that, but he sure seemed at least somewhat sympathetic to Lavrov's point of view here. You know, he certainly didn't like ridicule him or something, which you can read in State Department cables where they go, oh, can you believe the nerve of this guy to try to tell me this or tell me that? You know, Burns here, it seems to be relaying this like, yeah, this is a pretty reasonable take that we need to be cognizant of here and take this very seriously. OK, well, just uh, three months later um, in April or was it four months later in May? I think it was in April of 08. They met in Bucharest. And the Germans screamed bloody murder about it and absolutely vetoed and said, you cannot bring Russia, or you cannot bring Ukraine or Georgia into NATO. Absolutely not. Why? For only one reason. It'll be an unnecessary provocation against the Russians. We should not do that. Angela Merkel put her foot down. So then what did W. Bush do? He and Condoleezza Rice went ahead and put out a statement saying, oh yeah, well, we're still putting them on the fast track for NATO membership. And we're approving a membership action plan for them. And we are moving them forward. They will be members of NATO one day. And that was like the compromise that they forced through. And I don't know if the Germans were even aware of it before they put it out. But that was what they ended up saying. Well, right after that, Mikhail Shakashvili, the guy who they put in power in the illegal coup d'etat of 2003, he tried to invade and conquer the breakaway uh, Georgian provinces of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Well, he didn't get very far in Abkhazia at all because he got his ass handed to him in South Ossetia. Now, when Georgia broke off from the Soviet Union, right after that, again, we we're talking very early 1990s, 1991, right after that, South Ossetia broke off from Georgia. And they've been under Russian protection, so-called under Russian peacekeepers, under a deal brokered by our allies in the European Union up until that time. And they clearly, the majority opinion in uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia both was to remain independent from Georgia. But see, if you wanna join NATO, you have to have your border issues resolved. You cannot have unresolved borders and join our military alliance because essentially then you're just, we're signing up to fight for your you know, to immediately get into a war over your borders. So that's one of our rules is we can't have a treaty alliance, especially NATO, with a country that has unresolved borders. So Shakashvili thought, well, I'll just invade and conquer South Ossetia and Abkhazia real quick, and that'll take care of that. Well, he killed Russian peacekeepers in his initial attack. And so the Russians then counterattacked, and they just lied like hell all through the second half of 2008, the entire American establishment and media just lied and pretended that the Russians started that war. Russia attacked Georgia. Russia invaded Georgia. It was just a lie. And for those of us who were staying up late on the night of August the 8th or whatever it was when it broke out, all of the European media in real time was reporting, Georgia is invading South Ossetia. It was hours and hours and hours before the Russians responded in kind. There's just no question whatsoever about what had happened there first. And, and including, you know, there were people who were on the ground there who saw it, who, you know, Western reporters who were on the ground and told the truth about it. The New York Times didn't admit until the end of November 
that, oh, yeah, by the way, yeah, we lied to you about that. It turns out it was the Georgians. At least, you know, they would never even admit that at all now. At least then they admitted a, a few months later that they had gotten that all wrong. But anyway, you guys should know that during that time, the Russians were sending troops, armored personnel carriers and so forth under the Caucasus Mountains. This is the land. We're talking about bringing Georgia into the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. I have to tell you guys, guys, we're talking about between the Black and Caspian Sea, just so you can guys can get all, you know, I don't know what, is there such thing as conoitered? I only know reconnoitered. Get conoitered. We're talking about the Southern Caucasus Mountains between the Black and Caspian Sea, and whether they should be members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization or not. Anyway, so the Russians start sending armor under the mountains. There's something called the Roki Tunnel that goes under the Caucasus Mountains. It's a hell of a tunnel. I don't know how they did that. Anyway, Dick Cheney, the vice president, demanded that W. Bush strike the tunnels, launch missiles. You know, you've seen the laser guided missiles that can fly right down a chimney or in a window or whatever. He wanted to fly missiles into the tunnels and blow up the tunnels and collapse the tunnels on the heads of the Russian uh, armored divisions uh, pouring through them into Georgia at that time. And this is a man who was vice president. And if anything had happened to W. Bush, he would have been the president of the United States. And the only thing that stopped him from doing it at the time was the cool, patient wisdom of George W. Bush, who by that time had learned that every time he did what Dick Cheney said, everything caught on fire and was terrible and horrible and wrong. And he was going to go down in history as the world's worst president ever because he listened to Dick Cheney. So by then he said, no, we're not doing that. And they didn't do that. But that's there are two solid reports that that happened on Bush's war cabinet and that Stephen Hadley, Bush said, anybody else agree with Vice? And nobody raised their hand. And Stephen Hadley said, OK, moving on to the next issue. And then that was the end of that. But seriously, like it sounds kind of flip and funny and, and whatever, because it's such a crazy story. But can you guys imagine like literally we were. You know, somewhere closer to a nuclear war with Russia. In a border dispute. Now we're talking 7000 miles or you know, 6000 miles east of Washington, D.C in the Southern Caucasus mountains. It's completely crazy to think that when, I mean, you couldn't get um, probably one in a hundred Americans to even tell you there's such a place as what we now call former Soviet Georgia. Because otherwise, if you talk about Georgia, people think you're talking about the state between Florida and South Carolina. In fact, a friend told me a story about how when Russia invaded Georgia in 08, as someone came into her business saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, the Russians have invaded Georgia. And he was really freaking out. And it took a while for them to get across for him to understand there's this country in the world called Georgia way over there between the Black and Caspian Sea. And that they invaded this place called South Ossetia. I know you've never heard of it. It's none of your damn business. But anyway, there's a war going on there and that's what's going on. But the guy was really afraid that America was under attack by the Russians. Is, and people do get that misconception that but that's how, you know, you have to explain that that's how particular we mean when we're talking about this border dispute. It has nothing to do with the USA and everything to do again with how many people in this room raise your hand had ever heard of South Ossetia before I said that. All right. Word up. You guys are smart. You guys you guys read antiwar.com every day. The rest of you are far behind. Um, no, it's not your fault. Uh, why should you know about South Ossetia? Unless your grandma was from there, how would you have ever heard of it? Other than America was involved in a border dispute there, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't, you didn't, it, it might as well be a region of, you know, a county in Mongolia. Of course, you don't know the name of it. Why would you know the name of it? You know, it's fair. It's okay that you don't know the name of it. You shouldn't know the name of it. You know, it's only that W. Bush made it your business that it is now your business to know. Um, uh, and then, uh, oh, and he also uh, recognized the sovereignty of Kosovo, which was in direct contravention of the peace treaty that ended the war, where they broke off Kosovo and made it a NATO protectorate in 99. And he went ahead in 08 and recognized it as a sovereign nation state, which he had no right whatsoever to do. And which, of course, was invoked by Vladimir Putin. In, in Putin's declaration of war, he invoked uh, Bill Clinton's um, humanitarian war in Kosovo arguments, 
He said, yeah, there's a genocide going on in the Donbass. We have a responsibility to protect and go in there and stop it. And he said, the Ukrainians are threatening to make nuclear weapons. Weapons of mass destruction, he said uh, in his declaration of war. And of course, in, in both cases, they broke the law. And I'm not a big UN guy. I say, get us out of the UN, screw the UN. But it is a ratified treaty. It is the law of the, of the United States. It's the law of the world. You're not allowed to start a war unless you have a UN Security Council resolution that says that you can. If France and Britain and Russia and China agree with American Britain to start a war, then we get to have a war. Otherwise, we don't. Well, when Bill Clinton wanted to have a war, he just had one anyway. What are the Russians going to do about it? He did over Yeltsin's dead body. And when Bush wanted to go to Iraq, he couldn't even get NATO because France and Germany were dead set against it. So he had to just use a coalition of the willing, which is just this made up thing. America can start an aggressive war if we want to. Obama did get a resolution for the war in uh, Libya, um, but he lied to the new Russian president, um, Dmitry Medvedev, in order to get it. Hillary Clinton told him, this is, we're just going to do a no-fly zone to protect the people of Benghazi. And again, another total hoax. This time, it's that Gaddafi is about to kill hundreds of thousands of innocent men, women, and children, when that was just a completely made-up, ridiculous lie. Um, but they used that, and they, and they uh, made a chump out of Medvedev. Here, Putin, they call this guy Vladimir Putin a dictator. And I got to admit, he is kind of president for life, like Franklin Roosevelt. And then again, Roosevelt only half overthrew the Constitution. He didn't o entirely overthrow our Constitution. And I think that's the same thing with Putin, that, you know, he's willing to bend it to keep himself in office. And yet he could have just named himself Tsar of Vladimir the Great or something like that. He hasn't tried to do that. He appears to mean to leave something like a constitutional form of government behind him when he leaves power. And look at what he really did. Tell me you know of a dictator in the world who stood down from the presidency for a few years. And yes, it's true. Medvedev was his hand-picked right-hand man. Uh, and, and he didn't leave power altogether. He went to go sit as prime minister in the Rada for a while. But still, or the Duma, pardon me. Um, still, he was raising the idea that maybe he was not all that important. Uh, and that maybe Russian society could be governed without him, which is not a very good idea for a dictator to raise a question like that. But then when Hillary and Obama made a chump out of Medvedev, Putin came back after only one term. He, it seemed like he was going to wait at least two terms to see what happened. And instead he decided, well, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. And he went and took the presidency back as a direct, it's just inarguable, as a direct consequence of Hillary and Obama making a chump out of Medvedev in uh, Libya there uh, with their, you know, supposedly obeying the law, but again, breaking it and, you know, twisting it. Um, now, which brings us to Obama. So Obama, first of all, continued to expand NATO. He brought four or five more countries in. I need to memorize uh, the numbers of how many each president, but still it was plenty. He continued installing the anti-missile missiles with their dual use missile launchers in Poland. Um, and he did the coup of 2014. Now here's the coup of 2014 in Ukraine. The guy that they prevented from taking power in 04 was a guy named Yanukovych from the Party of Regions, which is a more or less pro-Russian leaning party from the east of the country. However, Yanukovych really was a neutralist and was trying to tread a neutral path between east and west here. And what happened was the guys that they stopped, the guys that the Americans installed in 04, they kept losing. Everybody hated them. They were terrible. Uh, Yushchenko and Timoshenko, um, they kept losing. And then this guy Yanukovych won the election again in 2010 in a free and fair election. Well, in 2013, the Americans, you guys decide whether this was deliberate or if this was just bad diplomacy. For the sake of argument, let's just say it was bad diplomacy. But then again, I think it's at least a possibility that they gave him an offer he couldn't possibly accept and deliberately so. And here's what I mean by that. The deal was not to get into NATO, but to join the EU 
or at least to sign a trade deal with the EU, not actual membership, but to sign a new trade deal with the EU. Now, they had promised him easier terms, but when he, sh when he showed up to sign the deal in early November 2013, he said, I feel like a bride who showed up at my wedding to be greeted with a prenuptial agreement. And now I'm not so sure I'm in the mood and even in love with you anymore. I'm going home. And what had happened was they had tried to add all these new restrictions. They said that they had to raise the pension age and lower the amount of the pension payments to people, that they had to take on these huge loans, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with the economic hitman model of, you know, American you know, Clintonian foreign policy, so-called free markets and democracy, what happens is they bribe a leader of a poor country into taking on so much debt for the nation that they can never pay it. And then, ah, that's fine. We don't want your money. We can just print money or steal it from Americans all day or whatever. We want money. We don't want your money. We want your grain. We want your water. We want your oil. We want your most important and usually nationally owned resources like oil and water and the most important things. Well, in Ukraine, they have all this grain. You got Cargill and Archer Daniels Midland and all these guys just, drip, you know, uh, salivating, uh, waiting to get their hands on all that. The, this is the American way is try to gangsterize this poor country into indebting, indebting themselves in a way that we get to keep the collateral. That's what we want is not the not the cash, but the collateral. So they tried to pull one of those scams on Yanukovych and he just said, forget it, we're not doing that. And he didn't sign the deal. Putin offered him way better terms. And by the way, Putin said, you can have a deal with the EU too if you want. But the EU said, if you sign a deal with Russia, you can't sign a deal with us. You have to choose. Now, again, that may have been deliberate to get him to say, well, fooey, then I'm not gonna do it. But that is what he did. And then what happened was the... Ukrainian nationalists in the western half of the country were mad as hell because they were one, they wanted to tilt west toward Europe, but two, they wanted to tilt west away from Russia. They really hate Russia. And again, as I mentioned, under the Soviet Union, the Ukrainians were absolutely, I mean, holocausted essentially in what's called the Holodomor under Joseph Stalin in the 30s. They were terribly repressed. My wife, I try not to bring up my family in these stories, but my wife and her family escaped from Soviet communism in Ukraine in 1978. And it was as brutal a totalitarian police state as you have ever heard. If you guys have ever heard the most hateful right-wing hawk denouncing communism, he's right. It's that bad. It really is. It really was. And those people really suffered under what was essentially a Russian empire, the Soviet Union. It's not like Marxism really meant that everyone shed any identity other than worker. You know what I mean? Like they, they were dominated by the Russians and there's tons of resentment there. So especially in the ethnic, in hell, in fact, the reason you have so many ethnic Russians in the East is because Stalin kidnapped a bunch of Ukrainians and moved them out to Uzbekistan or something out in the steppes and moved a bunch of Russians in back in, you know, the days of the Soviet Union in the 30s and the 40s and all that kind of thing. So not that that's the fault of anyone who's there in eastern Ukraine now or that they're responsible for that. But I'm just saying there is a very effed up and bloody and, and mixed up history in this land here. And, you know, the country has really only been an independent nation since 1991. Before that, it was part of the USSR. Before that, it was part of the Russian Empire. Before that, it was part of the Lithuanian Empire. And before that, part of the Polish Empire. They never were independent. Um, it was always the question of who they were dominated by. It's a brand new nation, really. Anyway, um, so in the west of the country, they were pissed that the guy, that Yanukovych did not sign the deal with the EU. And then, lo and behold, millions of dollars just materialized in order to support this massive so-called revolution movement in the Maidan. That's kind of the town square there in Kiev. And so thousands of people were kept out there through the winter months, through November, December, January, and into February. And they were kept fed. They were kept entertained. There's rock shows and big screen TVs. And there's, you know, somebody servicing the porta potties. And the whole thing is a put on by essentially the NGOs. You know, is the whether the CIA was directly involved or not, I don't know. I bet they probably were helping to coordinate. But the National Endowment for Democracy, 
and the National Democratic Institute and International Republican Institute and all the different George Soros and Pierre Omidyar foundations and so forth, they all just coughed up the money to support this movement. And then you guys um, may be familiar, it comes up from time to time, uh, but you might remember from back then, it was a controversy. The F the EU phone call that was intercepted, presumably by the Russians, possibly by uh, then Ukrainian intelligence and posted on YouTube. And this is approximately February 9th, I think, uh, 2014. Now the F the EU phone call is Victoria Newland, who importantly is Robert Kagan's wife, Robert Kagan, who is one of the premier theorists of the neoconservative movement. He uh, co-authored toward a neo-Reaganite foreign policy in 1996 and is a co-author of PNAC and a huge booster of uh, Rock War II 20 years ago and all the rest of it, uh, Bill Crystal's writing partner. And um, Newland is on the phone with Jeffrey Pyatt. Oh, and pardon me, she was the Deputy Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, which essentially means she was like the ambassador to the EU, more or less, um, or kind of a, an ambassador at large for European affairs. And she's on the phone with Jeffrey Pyatt, the ambassador to the Ukraine. And they're talking about who's going to make up the new government when they overthrow the old one. And there's just no question that they're plotting the coup. You can hear it with your own ears. The reason she says F the EU is because the Germans are seeking a compromise. The Germans are not hell bent on a coup and an overthrow. They're trying to work things out somehow. And so, you know, CNN and the Washington Post tell you, oh my goodness, did you hear the news? A diplomat used a bad word. Well, she got a talking to and had to go to her room without dessert or something, you know, and that's the end of the story. They never tell you, well, what's the point? Why was she saying F the EU? She's saying F the EU because if the Germans won't overthrow the government of Ukraine for us, we'll just goddamn do it ourselves then. That's what she's on about. That's what she's upset about. And you guys can listen to it yourself. You can find it on YouTube, original version right there. Um, it's the same one posted back then. Now, in fact, the Wall Street Journal had a recent write-up about the run-up to war here where they mentioned this and the way that Michael Gordon, the same guy who lied us into war with Iraq 20 years ago, uh, at the New York Times, the way he wrote it in the Wall Street Journal, he said, later, some audio was leaked where Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pyatt were discussing who would take positions in the new government. Yeah, uh, not later, before the coup. Two weeks before the coup, the American ambassador to the EU and the American ambassador to Ukraine were caught red-handed and it was posted on YouTube. And then they went ahead and did it anyway. They overthrew the government anyway. George uh, Friedman from Stratfor, uh, in an interview with the Russian media, uh, Commerzant, said this was the most obvious coup in world history. Henry Kissinger implied without directly saying so that we were behind it and we should not have done that. And of course, John Mearsheimer famously wrote a massive piece for foreign affairs, which I interviewed him about right after. Uh, this is in the summer of 14 when it came out, um, saying that the Ukraine crisis is America's fault, which is, or I guess he put it, the West's fault, which is just true. Um, because here's what happened. Once they, um, uh, what they, in fact, here's what they did. They, they were able to uh, get the Germans to participate in the coup. What they did was they did the compromise. And the compromise was you have to agree to pull your police back <clears throat> and you have to agree to new elections in a few months. Yanukovych signed the deal, pulled the police back. But then the protesters said, screw that. And all they did was just fill in the vacuum where the police had been and, and seized all the government buildings in Kiev. And then later that night, Yanukovych had to flee. Now, one of the reasons that they were able to do that, or one of the reasons that they chose to do that probably is related to the fact that many of the protesters out there on the Maidan were Nazis, Hitler-loving Nazis, the proud grandsons 
of the Galatian SS and the guys that we talked about earlier that George Bush Sr. must have been wary of, that he knew the CIA had backed during all the battle days of the Cold War against the Soviet Union. And these groups, Right Sector and Svoboda, which used to be called the Social National Party, get it? Social National? <clears throat> Um, and then there's C14. The 14, of course, stands for the 14 famous words of the white supremacist slogan about the future for white children, et cetera, and all that. Um, and then the Azov Battalion and the Adar Battalion. All of them are, well, they're just avowed Nazis. I mean, you can't even really call them neo-Nazis. If I say neo-Nazis to you, you picture like a prison gang, right? Or you picture like some guy in cut off shorts and no shirt and no shoes yelling white power to a group of nobodies in the woods in Alabama, right? A bunch of guys with no power yelling white power. That's a neo-Nazi. These guys are just Nazis. These guys are the grandsons of Nazis. These guys have been Nazis this whole time. And they are not powerless idiots in the woods. They are a major set of armed factions in that country. And to the point where, well, for example, if you had a real large, you know, actual Nazi militia in, say, I don't know, the American South somewhere, uh, avowed uh, Aryan nations, but like thousands of them, dangerous numbers of them, and they're like threatening to take over a town or they did already or something. Well, the U.S. Army would go in there and disarm them one way or the other. They would be disarmed. And if it had to be extremely violent, it would be. But the U.S. Army would do that. And there are Nazis in our army, but they're like one here and one there. And they're like mostly undercover. OK, in Ukraine. When the military comes to confront the Nazis, the Nazis go, yeah, what are you going to do about it? And the military goes, well, hey, nothing because the Nazi groups are as well-armed and are as dangerous and are as powerful as the state military there. And in many cases, when the state military won't show up and do the job, the Nazis do. Um, and so there's even footage of the current president of Ukraine, Zelensky, when he first was elected president, he went to meet with some of these Nazis fighting on the front. I'm skipping ahead, I'll go back in just a second, but. There's the war in the east of the country has been going on since 2014 in the aftermath of the coup. And Zelensky tries to tell these guys, hey, listen, I want you to pull back. I want you to, you know, we have this peace deal, the ceasefire that we're working on and we, our government signed it. And so we need to do that and this and that. And they just tell him, go to hell. Who the hell do you think you are, little man? And this kind of thing. And, and he protests, and this is how you guys can find this when you want to Google this later, just Google Zelensky. And I am not a loser because that's what he says. He starts protesting. He has a guy who's like a, uh, an enlisted guy in the army. He's not an officer. He's just some guy in the army is reading him the riot act and telling him, go to hell. Why should we do what you say, punk? And, and he goes, listen, I'm the president of this country. I'm a 41 year old man. I'm not a loser. You can't just talk to me like I'm some loser. And they're like, yeah, well, whatever. We're not withdrawing from here. And if you somehow pull a thousand of us back, we'll bring 10,000 more. And he says, okay, you guys win. Sorry for troubling you. I hope you have a good rest of your weekend. And he leaves and that's it. And they punked his ass and he left. They're the president, not him. He's nothing. They have the power and he doesn't. They have the weapons to fight and he is essentially at their mercy. Um, and that is why his military does not disarm them. They're wholly dependent on them. Um, although they remain independent, obviously, of the government and do what they like. Um, and now, so as soon as the government takes over in 2014, the um, uh, three former presidents sign an open letter demanding that now is our chance to kick the Russians out of the Sevastopol naval base on the Crimean Peninsula. That's, again, we're talking about 5,000 miles east of Washington, D.C. here. This is uh, this little uh, peninsula, this jut of land sticking out into the north of the Black Sea from uh, the south of Ukraine there. And what you need to know about uh, Crimea, first of all, is that the Russians first kicked the Turks out of there and seized it for their own under Catherine the Great in 1783 
Now, if that year sounds familiar to your ears, it's because you've probably learned in school that that's the year that Benjamin Franklin and John Adams and John Jay went across the sea to sign the Treaty of Paris to end America's Revolutionary War with Britain. Four years before our constitution was even written, seven before it was ratified and implemented. That's how long uh, Crimea has belonged to Russia. In other words, if Virginia belongs to the United States of America, then Crimea belongs to Russia. And in fact, as long as we're making comparisons to American states, you guys think about uh, what you know about West Point and how uh, important it is for New Yorkers. This was you know, Benedict Arnold's treason, was he tried to give up West Point to the British. And this is now like our most highly honored uh, military uh, school and inst officer school and institution in America. Imagine if some foreign power tried to take West Point from the New Yorkers, what they would do. I'm from Texas. You guys know how we feel about the Alamo. Uh, imagine a foreign power trying to occupy San Antonio and take it away from the Anglos of Texas. All you would be able to hear is the barking of machine gun fire until that was reversed. This is just as simple as that. There's just no question about that, right? Okay, well, the Russians lost more than 300,000 men fighting to keep the Nazi Germans and Romanians out of Crimea in World War II. And they actually lost it for a while and had to win it back at some of the highest costs that you can imagine. As you guys all know, millions of people died in Ukraine uh, in World War II, including in the Holocaust, but also just in the fighting. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Russians died to keep the Crimean Peninsula out of the hands of Adolf Hitler. So if, uh, if it belongs to Russia, like Virginia belongs to the United States of America, well, you saw the North uh, take and give hundreds of thousands of lives to keep Virginia uh, back in the 1860s. Um, in fact, you know, we make the speaking of the Civil War, we make the parallel uh, oftentimes. What if um, America, uh, what if the Russians had won the Cold War? And what if they expanded the Warsaw Pact to include our Western European friends? And then they started bringing in countries in Latin America in uh, the Caribbean and Latin America, and maybe even Mexico into the Warsaw Pact. Then they overthrow the government of Canada twice in 10 years because they keep voting wrong. Then the Russians use a bunch of Hitler loving Nazis to overthrow the government in Ottawa. They then threaten to kick us out of our naval bases in Alaska. And they launch a war against the people of British Columbia who refuse to accept the new coup junta. What would America do? Right, we would invade Canada and probably nuke Moscow. And we would have our CIA and whatever clandestine forces would be throughout Canada in a way, making sure that never happened in the first place, ever, ever. People say, oh, Ukraine has the right to choose whatever military alliance they want. Oh, really? Would America let Canada join a military alliance with Russia? Would we let Mexico join in a military alliance with China? Let the Chinese build military bases on our southern border? No, we would invade. They it, Maybe in some metaphysical way, you have some philosophical argument, but I'm just telling you, as you guys all know, in practice, no, Mexico and Canada absolutely do not have the right to join in, in, into any military alliance other than with us, period. Uh, just the same as we would not uh, rec you know, allow uh, the Soviets to have a military alliance with Cuba. Well, guess what? During the Civil War, the French took over Mexico. Well, Abraham Lincoln was busy crushing the South at the time. But as soon as the war was over, the Americans lined up troops on the border with Mexico and told the French, if you don't get the hell out, we're going to war with you right now. So this is not hypothetical. I like my little Canada analogy. This actually happened in American history, that post Monroe Doctrine, one of them European powers tried to push their luck and make a military alliance with one of our bordering states. And we told them, no, we will kill all of you before we let you get away with that. And you know what they did? They went home without a fight because they knew that we meant it. That really happened, all right? Now, anyways, 
So um, these guys threatened to kick the Russians out of the Sevastopol naval base which is all important naval base to the Russians. All of the rest of their naval bases are in their north or in their far east, and they freeze over in the wintertime. This is their only all year round warm water port and access through the Black Sea and the Bosporus Strait there to the Mediterranean. This is as Zbigniew Brzezinski put it 25 years ago. With Crimea, uh, Russia is a regional power. Without Crimea, it's nothing. Uh, it's their naval base. It's the home of their Black Sea fleet. And so this is the American strategic interest is in always constantly trying to hem in the Russians any way that we can. Well, what Putin did was he just had his Marines and sailors leave their military bases and seize the peninsula. And nobody was killed. I mean, Wikipedia says six people were killed, but they can't even directly attribute any of those to direct fire from Russian sailors and Marines. They just essentially went outside and stood on street corners and said, this is our territory again now. And their, their monopoly on force was reestablished, essentially. That was about all there was to it. Um, there were some very small skirmishes with local forces, but I don't even know that it was proven that they had killed anyone at all. Um, if so, the highest number that I could find anywhere was six. Um, anyway, so it was a successful coup de main uh, when they took over the Crimean Peninsula. And you know what? Yes, that is against the law. But you know what? So is overthrowing the sovereign nation in the capital city like the Americans had done just two weeks before. And, and uh, all they were doing was the same thing that Clinton did in Kosovo, only without killing thousands of people. So what the hell? But then the people of the far east of Ukraine, the Donbass region, which is at issue in the current war, they declared independence from Kiev. In fact, first what they did was they just occupied government buildings and said, well, if you guys can occupy government buildings and overthrow the government, we can occupy government buildings and just refuse to accept your authority and, and refuse to accept the legitimacy of your coup regime here. And then the coup regime launched a war and just outright attacked them. And, um, you know, people say the Russians invaded. Again, Michael Gordon and his uh, retelling of this history in the Wall Street Journal recently says that the Russians spent, uh, sent regular forces across. That's never been proven. There are plenty of indications otherwise. In fact, the New York Times um, themselves, uh, months into the war, went and met with the Russian separatist side, and they had old Ukrainian military equipment. They did not have fresh new equipment that they'd gotten from the Russians at all. Um, the only you know, real credible allegations I ever saw about the Russians was that they had sent deniable clandestine forces across to help to coordinate the war and help the locals essentially keep Kiev at bay. But look, they could have invaded seven years ago. They could have taken over eight years ago. Um, they could have taken over the Donbass. Uh, Putin could have pulled out a black magic, magic marker and said the Donbass is now Russia. What are you going to do about it? That would have been the end of that. They were in no position whatsoever to do anything about it then. This is before America had poured in all of these Javelin missiles and all of the rest of this equipment. So they could have done it then, but they didn't do it. And there are a few reasons why. The first one is because Eastern Ukraine is a terribly poor place and a terribly aged population too. So that means if you're Russia, you're just essentially signing up millions of new people for your welfare roles and your pension roles who are not productive in any real way. There's some industry there, although their steel plant just got blown to hell in the last uh, you know, few days here in the fighting in Mariupol. Um, and they do have some advanced rocket engine factories and helicopter engine factories, but that's just about it. Everything else there is very run down and would require billions of dollars of investment to get it back up to speed and the ability to you know, compete in a global market rather than a very small and local protected one there. Um, also, if he absorbs the Donbass, that means he's absorbing, and I'm making up these percentages, but just so that you understand what I mean, he's absorbing 10% of 50%. You know, Right now, the country is essentially split 50-50, ethnic Ukrainians and Russians, and people who more or less, we're talking about then, especially now, he might've alienated quite a few million people recently, but especially back then, you're talking about half the country leans toward Russia and half the country not. Well, if he absorbs 10 percent of 50 percent, he's now diluting his own side's power and influence inside the country. Right. So that was a, another one of the reasons, I think, why he did not do it at the time. And then he signed a deal with the Europeans um, in order to avoid war or in, in order to end the fighting in the war. Um, and the vast majority of the 15 or so thousand people that were killed were killed by the Ukrainians. There were people on the separatist side 
killed by the Ukrainian regime, by which I mean the, the coup regime that America had put in power there. You go back to the F the EU phone call and Newland and Pyatt are saying, we got to glue this thing. We got to sail this thing. We got to midwife this thing. We're going to get it good and midwifed and sailed before they can do anything about it. You can bet that that, that Putin, once we do get it to go, he's going to do anything he can to torpedo it. Yeah, like seize the Crimean Peninsula and help the people in the east of the country resist uh, essentially an invasion from their own national capital uh, when they tried to uh, declare independence there. So the whole thing was, has been an absolute disaster. Now I mentioned John Mearsheimer earlier. He's the most prominent critic of this policy because he is the Dean of the realist school of foreign policy thinking in the United States of America. You can't call him a kook, he's not a kook. He, is, he and his, his buddy, Stephen Walt from Harvard are the leaders of the realist school AKA the banker oil man school compared to the neoconservatives or, you know, some of these other guys, but these are essentially the Kissingerians. These are the great power politics guys. Um, and, and Mearsheimer says, and you know, I don't think I ever got to say, yeah, but what about all the color coded revolutions? And I really asked that follow-up, but his narrative I think is mostly true anyway, which is that in the narrative of the NATO builders here, it's really just a defensive alliance. We're really not trying to threaten Russia. And um, the coup in Ukraine is, you know, maybe just more spreading stability or trying to um, kind of thing. But then it backfired and it led to this terrible war. And when you hear Mearsheimer's retelling of the story, Mearsheimer says it wasn't until 2014 that the Americans decided that Putin was a madman. Putin's a bad guy. Putin is evil. And that's why he does bad things, because that's what evil people do. That that wasn't the narrative, that NATO has to be there as a bulwark to protect against Russia. That wasn't the narrative until 2014. But you see their dilemma. They couldn't just admit this was their own damn fault. Vice President Biden and his national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, the same duo running our foreign policy right now and working with Victoria Newland, they should not have done this coup. It was one coup too many. And if we were all just drinking together with them right now, we would say to them, guys, come on, man, admit it. You just did one coup too many. You pushed your luck, but you pushed it too far. You got a whammy. Just admit that. It's okay to say you made a mistake. But they can't say that. They can't admit that. So the narrative is Putin is evil. Putin is Hitler. Putin is the czar. He's trying to recreate the Soviet Union. He's trying to recreate the old Russian empire. He's hell-bent on reabsorbing all Russian speakers in the world. And, and he's just a revanchist, uh, power, mad, crazy man. But he's the same guy that W. Bush said, I looked into his soul and I saw a good man. He's the same guy that Bill Clinton and W. Bush and Barack Obama and Donald Trump did business with this whole time. It doesn't make sense, guys, that he just woke up on the wrong side of the bed. What makes sense here is that George Kennan is, was right, that we're gonna expand NATO in such a way that it's gonna provoke a reaction from the Russians. And then when the Russians react, we're gonna say, see, that's how they are and that's why we have to do this. But I think Mearsheimer is right that even though I think they were targeting Russia more than he says, their narrative that they have to target Russia because how, how dangerous and crazy and scary Russia is, that didn't really change until 2014 in the aftermath of their coup when they had to blame his evil instead of their bad choices. And it's just, in other words, just CYA is really all it is, that story about his uh, pure evil here. Um, and then... Um, now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, people of the East voted to declare independence. In fact, the leaders, once they voted to declare independence, their leaders asked Putin to please, would he absorb them into the Russian Federation? And he told them no. So not only did he not choose to invade and take the area, they literally asked to be incorporated by a popular vote, asked to be incorporated into Russia, and he told them no. Instead, he signed a peace deal with the Germans and the French to try to bring a fighting to the end. The problem was the Americans never leaned on Kiev to live up to their side of the deal. 
Um, again, when um, Yan, uh, pardon me, when uh, Zelensky went to tell the militia fighters on the Eastern Front to back off, they told them to go to hell. Who the hell are you, Mr. President, to tell us what to do? You're nobody. Uh, we don't give a damn about your peace deal. These are the same people now threatening him that if he does sign a peace deal to end the current war, they'll just kill him and keep fighting. Um, and he has real reason to be worried about that, you know? Um, so he never implemented his end of the deal. The Russians did. They were supposed to give this new special federal status, you know, this new enhanced autonomy to the Donbass and help to rebuild the country, pull back all the fighters and all the rest of it, and, and peace would break out. They never lived up to their end of the deal this whole time. Now, Trump comes in. And I'm skipping, I swear to God, I'm not telling this story, but you guys better all know that Russia Gate was an entire hoax. Every bit of it. It was the Democrats and their law firm friends that came up with it that we know of in the first place. They very quickly enlisted the FBI Counterintelligence Division and CIA to help them frame Donald Trump and his campaign for collusion with a Russian effort to rig the election that never even happened. The Russians did not intervene at all. And the Trump people had nothing to do with that non-existent intervention at all. It was all a lie. And if you believed any of it, you can forgive yourself now, but it just wasn't true. But it's important because it put Trump so badly on the defensive. Because, you know, and he said, and I'm sure this is true. He goes, you know, I went and met with Henry Kissinger and I told Henry Kissinger, don't you think that we should cozy up to Russia to use them against China? China, China. And Henry Kissinger told me, why Donald Trump, you're the tallest, richest, wisest man I've ever met in my life. And you're so correct about that. Okay, I'm sure that Donald Trump was embellishing that part, but I'm sure that he's right. That Henry Kissinger told him, yes, that's right. Henry Kissinger was the guy who split China away from the Soviet Union under Richard Nixon when they opened China in 1974. Now, let's do it the other way around. Now that our previous presidents have pushed Russia and China together, now let's split Russia away from China. Now that Russia is the weaker power, we'll split them away and use them against China. So this was Donald Trump's thinking. China, China, China. It wasn't about loyalty to Russia ever in any way. It was China, China, China. And it, you don't have to be a PhD to know that, yeah, you want to like counterbalance major powers against each other and this kind of thing. Donald Trump is capable of that level of thinking, evidently. And that was what he was about. But they used that kernel of truth that he had a softer on Russia policy to build up this hoax against him. But it was all important because it meant then that he had all this pressure. I mean, they were accusing him of treason. And so, there's at least one quote from his son where he says, well, we're giving all these weapons to Ukraine. Let's see you call us pro-Russian traitors now, right? This is calculus in Trump world, right? It's the simple arithmetic. We'll prove that we're not Russian traitors by doing what the people falsely accusing us of that want us to do, uh, which is arm up the forces in Ukraine. Now, Barack Obama, who was the first black president to ever do a Nazi coup d'etat, he was afraid to arm them because he knew the coup had already backfired so badly. Now he's going to pour a bunch of weapons in there. There's already this horrible civil war going on in the East. It's not worth it. Let's not do it. Um, but Donald Trump comes in and starts pouring weapons in. And it's the consensus of his entire White House, of the CIA and the Pentagon and all of Congress bought and paid for that we got to do this. And he pours all these weapons in. He also brought two new countries into NATO, Macedonia and Montenegro. He uh, continued with the dual use missile launchers in Romania and Poland, and also uh, on ships at sea in the Baltic and Black Seas, where he launched massive naval exercises. He also, and look, honestly, guys, I don't know if, if Donald Trump had a thing to do with this or not, or if his Pentagon just has their own policy. They are the empire. They do what they want but they were flying nuclear bombers right up to 12 and a half miles off of Russia's coasts. And that's in the Black and the Baltic Seas there in the South and the North, and then also in the Far East in what's called the Ostok Sea, north of Korea, 
um, in the far east there, north of Vladivostok. And so that's, you know, 12 miles is their airspace, their legal airspace. So we're flying our nuclear bombers right up to 12 and a half miles off of their coast to force them to turn on all their radars and all of their for, all their defenses, essentially practicing a nuclear first strike against Russia. Now, I mean, that just does not happen here. If it was the case that the Russians were constantly flying their nuclear bombers off the coast of California and Maine and Connecticut and New Jersey and in the Gulf of Mexico, they're flying their, you know, uh, missile, uh, nuclear missile destroyers into the Gulf of Mexico, flying their nuclear bombers up to 12 miles off the coast of Texas. We would be at war over that. We wouldn't tolerate that at all. Hell, Ron Paul probably would take us to war over that. Um, you know, any president would, but they're expected to just sit there and take it. You know, we are the calmest, coolest, most collected rules based international order of governance and cooperation and friendship. Their government is ruled by the most violent, dangerous, psychopathic murderer on the planet. But he's supposed to just sit there and take it no matter what abuse that our side will continue to just dish out and dish out and dish out against his side. And you can see that that is their thinking in Washington, D.C., and it just doesn't play out. You know, speaking of Ron Paul, this is what he said to Rudy Giuliani in the famous Giuliani moment of May 2007 when they fought about the real causes of September 11th and the motivation of the hijackers and the bin Ladenites. And Ron Paul said, if we think that we can just go around the world doing whatever we want, bombing people, killing people, all this violence and destruction, and think that we'll, we can do that without generating this hatred uh, by people and their motivation to hit us back, that we do that at our own peril. You just can't sit here and pretend that nobody minds when you do what you do. In fact, they do, and they will react. And it's that kind of blind belief in themselves in their own exceptionalism that makes them do things like bomb Iraq from bases in Saudi for eight years straight, no matter how many times Osama bin Laden says he's going to kill us for it. They just keep doing it anyway. And then bin Laden kills us for it, right? 3,000 dead, almost all were in those towers and on those planes. There were a few hundred hit at the Pentagon. But, um, you know, not that they're, not that that's fine, but at least their combatants, you know, signed up for the thing. It's civilians that die in this thing. Um, and it's the same kind of thing here. We can do whatever we want. We can do whatever we want. And we just call it deterrence. It's all deterrence. And then if that fails and the bad thing happens anyway, well, that's still everybody else's fault but theirs. You know, again, go back to the FDEU phone call. We're going to glue it. We're going to midwife it. We're going to sneak it through. We're going to get it done. All these little turns of phrase that means we're going we're gonna to get away with this. Why Vladimir Putin, uh, while Vladimir Putin is distracted with the Sochi Olympics. Right. They didn't get away with it. It led immediately to the loss of Crimea and to this horrible war in the east that's now culminated into this full scale war and invasion by Russia uh, now eight years later. Uh, you know, but this is the kind of thinking we can do whatever we want. There's nothing that they can do about it. And so they just won't. They'll just have to sit there and take it. Um, now, Trump also tore up the Open Skies Treaty that allows each side to fly unarmed planes over each other's country, essentially so they can reassure each other or themselves that the other side is not mobilizing for war. Um, and so the Americans have such an advantage in space that they figure they don't need plane overflights. So let's tear up the treaty. But part of the reason for the treaty was so that the Russians will stay calm because they'll be able to see by overflying our country that we are not mobilizing for a full scale war with them. And it might be nice if we could keep their fears and emotions and, and you know, paranoia on that issue at a low ebb. But instead, the American attitude is, well, screw them. We got our satellites. We don't need planes. So let's just tear up the treaty, which just puts us all in more danger. In fact, the MIT professor um, Ted Postal put out a press release a few weeks ago saying America's early warning system is so good. You have no idea. Nobody can launch a rocket of any size any of you know space capability anywhere in the world without us knowing about it instantly, period. I mean, they could launch from a barge in the Antarctic and we would see it. The Russians do not have that capability. The Russians capability to detect incoming 
nuclear weapons. It's not like something in the movie where it just works. It actually doesn't work very well at all. Their capability for incoming warning and, and their radars and satellite systems and so forth are far behind ours. And so that just means their, their trigger finger, their launch on warning trigger finger is that much itchier because they have that much more to fear from the unknown. So in other words, if you were president, you would do the responsible thing and get right the hell back in that treaty. Let the Russians fly over our country in their unarmed planes and let them take note that we are not mobilizing for war with them. If they want to do that seven days out of the week, that's fine with me. This was, again, Ike Eisenhower's idea. You know, Ike Eisenhower, who was the five-star general commander of all United Nation forces in Europe in World War II, who became the two-term Republican president of the United States of America. Him. He was the guy who said, man, we should let them know that we're not getting ready to attack them. That way, they won't think that we are, which would be conducive to keeping the peace. Donald Trump tore that up. The other one was the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty that Ronald Reagan uh, had signed back in 1987. And this treaty kept mid-range nuclear missiles out of Europe for 30 years. Now, when Reagan took office, he built up mid-range nuclear missiles in Europe because the Soviets had started to put some mid-range missiles in. And Reagan said, oh yeah, I can match you, watch this. And he started dumping in, I think they were the Neptune, no, 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 that's different. Um, the Pershing missiles, Pershing mid-range missiles started pouring them into Germany. And then he gave them all away and negotiated them all away. And all the American hawks were so mad. And he said, no, you dummies. We only built up that missile force so that we could trade it away. You know, we're playing a game of cards here and we wanted to have a strong hand. But if the Reds are willing to give up their mid-range missiles, then we are too. Sign, Gorby. And they signed. And they kept mid-range nuclear missiles out of Europe for 30 years. And Donald Trump tore that treaty up. And this plays in to what we talked about before, those dual-use missile launchers and Putin's repeated statements of the threat of American NATO expansion. You keep saying it's just a defensive alliance, but you overthrow any government friendly to our country. You keep moving it closer and closer to our borders. And now you tore up the law that says that you promise to keep H-bombs out of Europe or, you know, mid-range missiles, at least out of Europe. We still have planes that can deliver them in Germany, but that's a different question. Um, but to keep mid-range missiles out. And he said this over and over again, you guys, if um, in his declaration of war in February, he said, if they put, I forgot what it was called, X kind of mid-range missile in Kharkiv in Eastern Ukraine, then those missiles could get here to, to Moscow in 15 minutes. He said, if they launched a Tomahawk cruise missile from there with an H-bomb on it, it could get here in 10 minutes. And if they launched a hypersonic missile from Kharkiv, it could get to Moscow in five minutes, five minutes. He said, this is like a knife at our throat. It's absolutely intolerable and we're just not going to tolerate it. And again, I'm not justifying what he did, but I am explaining that what he did while not reasonable was rational and was a defensive, essentially reaction. It was not entire. Well, it was an offensive invasion. It was an aggressive war, but it was a reaction to provocation by the United States, um, uh, particularly. Now, um, uh, Biden comes in, to his credit, he saved the New START Treaty, which Trump had promised to let expire. Well, this is the last treaty that limits the overall number of deployed H-bombs on both sides. All the SALT-1 and SALT-2 and all those things are all dead and expired now. The only one left is called New START, and that limits both sides to, as I was saying before, approximately 6,000 on each side, about 2,500 deployed and the rest in storage there. Um, Trump had vowed to let that treaty expire. And Biden, to his credit, at least say that it's probably the best thing he ever did in his sorry life, other than get out of Afghanistan, maybe even better than getting out of Afghanistan. Um, um, but then he did not save the Open Skies Treaty or the INF. And as soon as he got back into power, Putin said, hey, let's restore those treaties. You guys say that Trump is the root of all evil. Well, he's the one who tore these treaties up, but I like them. Let's get back in them. And Biden said, nope, forget it. Doesn't want to do it. And they want those mid-range missiles. Um, um, now, uh, last 
spring, they launched the Sea Breeze, massive naval exercise in the Black Sea, and they increased the bomber flights and uh, the naval missions in the Black and Baltic Seas all through, you know, the first year of Biden. And in September, they invited um, uh, Vladimir Zelensky to the White House uh, for a big meeting where he uh, again brought up a NATO membership and where Biden uh, and his government promised hundreds of millions of dollars of new weapon sales. And that's also when the Turks started dumping in a bunch of these new drones and started using them to take out uh, pro-Russian forces in the East, violating the ceasefire and escalating tensions there. And then at the end of September, or was, maybe it was in October, they signed, I'm sorry, I forget the name of it. I don't have it on, offhand, but it's this new kind of important memorandum of understanding, this new agreement between America and Russia. Again, not bringing them into NATO, but promising, again, reaffirming our promise that we are in the process of bringing them into NATO, present tense, maybe in slow motion, but it is happening. And we're standardizing their military forces with ours. And we're continuing to send them hundreds of millions of dollars worth of weapons on top of the billions that Trump had already sent them, I think, two or three billion dollars worth of weapons there. Now, they say, no, don't worry. These are all defensive weapons, not offensive weapons. This is just a Javelin anti-tank missile. Don't drive your tank near it and you won't get shot by it. This kind of thing. But of course, the war in the East was still going on all along. And American forces, American, you know, Rangers and CIA were training the fighters fighting in the war all along. And they're using these weapons against the people in the Donbass region uh, throughout that whole time. So you had these peace deals, the Minsk one and Minsk two deals. But um, essentially, the low level fighting continued all along. They remained, uh, you know, short of being fully implemented. Um, and so um, the uh, uh, oh, in The New York Times in December, they said, you know, we're dumping in all of these weapons because we're trying to deter Russia from attacking. And we're carefully calibrating the amount of weapons so that they'll be deterred, but not provoked. Well, so either they suck at calibrating the proper amount of weapons to pour into Ukraine, or they decided to turn up the amount of weapons on that dial in order to provoke the invasion that they got. I think the former choice is the most likely, but then again, you know, the second choice there is not precluded. And I'll tell you one of the main reasons that I think that they wanted this war to happen. I mean, first of all, Putin in, in, in December issued a treaty, proposed a new treaty that was frankly reasonable, at least as the basis for an opening discussion. I'm not saying we had to just sign right onto the damn thing, but essentially it was not unreasonable. It just said that we promise Ukrainian neutrality and that we're not gonna bring them into NATO and they promise not to try to join NATO. And we promise to stop arming them. And we promise to live by Bill Clinton's promise from 1997. I know that sounds like ancient history, but the promise was, yes, we're bringing these countries into NATO, but we promise not to put our military equipment into those countries. Well, of course they broke that promise. Clinton did and then Bush and Obama and the rest, hell Obama, and Trump, I think, both held military exercises just hundreds of yards from the Russian border in the Baltic states there. Um, and Putin said, I want you to live up to that deal and bring your guys uh, back to the lines as they were in 97. And I want you to get rid of the dual use missile launchers in Romania and Poland. Right? Like all of this should have been our policy anyway. Um, that promise was a promise. Why would we move military equipment closer to Russia? It's just a defensive alliance and no one's threatening our friends. And why would we do that? Why not agree? If we know the Germans won't let Ukraine into NATO, and we know that Biden's policy was, come on, we're not going to bring Ukraine into NATO at least any time in the next, you know, 10 years, which is, you know, far past his presidency. Why wouldn't he just put that in writing? They absolutely would not put that in writing. In fact, they refuse to even discuss it beyond, yeah, don't worry, we promise we're not going to do it, or not even we promise, but we just say we're not going to. And, and Putin said he was worried that we might put nuclear missiles in Ukraine. And Biden goes, come on, we're not going to put nuclear missiles in Ukraine. And Putin says, well, get back in the INF treaty. And, Putin, and, and Biden says, no. So if you go back to last December, American diplomacy was, Putin's preparing to invade Ukraine. Hey, Putin, 
you better not, or there's going to be consequences. But that was it. There was no offer that, okay, look, we could negotiate on a couple of these points. Again, Biden, Sullivan, Newland, these are the very same people who overthrew the government in 2014 working for Barack Obama. They know that this is partially their fault. They could have just said, you know what? Okay, we can give a little on something. And instead they refused. They simply said, you better not damn do it. And then here's the final provocation. At the Munich Security Conference in February, Vladimir Zelensky said, well, if the other parties aren't going to live up to the Budapest Declaration, which is where America, Britain, um, and this and the uh, Russians promise to guarantee uh, Ukrainian security, as long as they promise to give up all their nukes to the Russians, which is what they did, he said, well, if everybody else isn't going to abide by it, well, then maybe we just won't abide by it anymore either. In other words, he was threatening to get nuclear weapons. Now, come on, guys. They've been threatening since the 1st of November that Russia's about to invade Ukraine. Now, there's only two ways to get nuclear weapons. One is somebody hands you one. Or two, you got to make one. Well, Lyndon Johnson did give weapons grade material to the Israelis, but that's an exception. Otherwise, we do not pass out nuclear weapons. The Brits do not pass out nuclear weapons. The French do not pass out nuclear weapons. You know, we have the non-proliferation treaty. We don't give nukes even to our closest friends. Okay, there's just the idea that we're going to give a nuke to Kiev. Forget it. Just no one's even thinking that. That's crazy. Okay, now they can make one and it is 1940s technology as we know. However, it ain't easy. And the idea that the Ukrainians would be able to create a Manhattan project inside Ukraine that Russia would not be able to know about and be able to destroy before they could succeed with it is ridiculous. It's the same thing like our standoff with Iran right now. Iran has a latent nuclear capability, but they know if they really try to make bombs, that we would bomb them before they finish their first bomb, right? So it's the same thing here. There's no way that Ukraine could make a nuke without getting invaded first. So now you tell me, why did Vladimir uh, Zelensky say that? Oh, well, if you're not going to abide by the Budapest memorandum, maybe we won't either. Other than he's the sock puppet of the CIA and they wanted this war. The Americans wanted this war. They were jerking Vladimir Putin's chain trying to provoke him into doing it. Or at least as they said about the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, they said, well, we were knowingly increasing the likelihood that they would. You can call that a provocation if you want, but yeah. And now look, I went back and I should have done a better job of this in real time, but I'm always like our generals fighting the last war. So I'm here traveling around the country giving speeches about the wars in the Middle East. Um, while all this is going on. But I went back and looked. And if you guys do a deep dive at the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Yahoo News, and a couple of others, from November, December, January, February, leading up to the war, you will see over and over and over again, the American national security state telling these important papers that, yeah, see, what we're gonna do is, we're going to replicate the war in Afghanistan in the 80s, where we helped the Afghan Mujahideen bog down and bleed the Soviet Union. Same thing we did to Iran and the Syrians in the dirty war in Syria. Now you can read, again, that same story from the New York Times where they talk about carefully calibrating the arms. Well, in there, there's a quote from Admiral James Stravridis. Now he was going to be the Secretary of Defense under Hillary Clinton, either him or Michelle Flournoy, but he was definitely going to be very high up in her National Security Council um, is who he is. Very important guy. And he told the New York Times then, hey, hey, hey. And again, yeah, you could kind of believe this. I think this is probably plausible. Look, plan A is to tell the Russians, you better not. Plan B does not include diplomacy. What's diplomacy? Plan B is the Russians invade and we try to prolong the war as long as we can. We pour in as many weapons as we can 
to what they assumed would be an insurgency. They assumed that the Russians would crush the Ukrainian military, you know, right away, uh, which they have not quite succeeded in doing, although they're making progress. Um, but that, you know, essentially the entire question was, we're going to arm an insurgency against the Russians. The Russians are going to invade and occupy this country, and we're going to bog them down and bleed them to bankruptcy. Now, I have to object, possibly because I've been at this for 20 years straight, and maybe because I wrote a book about the war in Afghanistan. And I know a lot of people kind of don't care about this that much, and especially now anymore. But I have to tell you, for these men, only just three months after losing the Afghan war to the Taliban and retreating from that country with their tail between their legs after having killed upwards of three quarters of a million people over a generation, blown $4 trillion, caused the suicides of something like 10,000 American GIs who came home from that war. And these guys, our Democrats, got the word Afghanistan in their mouths after we only just left in September. September. From the consequences, a 20-year war fighting against the consequences of the covert war that they waged there in the 1980s. And just two, three months later, these same people are telling the New York Times, yeah, we want to replicate Afghanistan. Now you, again, you might say, yeah, I mean, Afghanistan, the 80s, Rambo 3, that's like a black and white movie, right? That's ancient history. You know, Scott Horton was even a kid back then. But we just left. Afghanistan didn't stop. Afghanistan was going on this whole time. And our, our very recent late war there was just wrapping up 40 years of American intervention in that country. And these guys have the nerve to say, we want to do that again. Then they turn around and they invoke Obama's dirty war in Syria, a war that, as y'all know, killed 500,000 people and led directly to the rise of the Islamic Caliphate that conquered all of Eastern Syria in 2013 and all of Western Iraq in 2014 and led to Iraq War Three and another entire effort on the side of the Shiites in Iraq, another war that killed another few hundred thousand innocent civilians caught up in that war, with ISIS taking over that country. ISIS being, for those of you not too familiar, maybe you weren't paying too close of attention in 2014 and 15, but this is essentially like the Khmer Rouge. This is literally like bin Laden and his men taking over a country. It was Baghdadi instead, but the same damn difference. Um, and then they want to bring up Afghanistan and Syria as the model for what they want to do in Ukraine, in Eastern Europe, and where we've already had jihadists from the war in Syria go and help fight with the Nazis against the people, against the pro-Russian forces in the east of the country. It's just absolute madness. Um, and they continue to pour in weapons. And as all you guys have seen, I mean, you can read this in uh, the Post and the Times and the Journal, and you can see it on TV every day. They just keep sending in more weapons. Nobody's even talking about diplomacy. Today's Tuesday, right? So it's been 63 days since our Secretary of State talked with the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov. The last time they spoke was February the 15th. Because the Americans very likely wanted this war to happen and certainly are happy to see it continue as they even put it, to bleed Russia. So, you know, they talk about, again, and as I stipulated at the beginning, correctly, Vladimir Putin and his regime's responsibility for launching this war. And yet they are absolutely as evil as him. They are absolutely as corrupt and, and corrupt in their motives and in their actions as the enemy, as any of their enemies anywhere in the world. After all, the Soviets lost the Cold War 30 years ago. That red flag came down 30 years ago, last Christmas Day. America is the lone world superpower. 
USA number one, the world empire. We're not talking about Russia in Canada. We're talking about America in Ukraine. And the responsibility for that lies on the part of the Americans who pursued this policy this whole time. Um, oh, and one more thing, and I'll leave you with it. The Republicans and the Democrats have, you know, real psychological problems, essentially. The Democrat, well, first of all, the Republicans, and I mean the leadership, not all their voters, but the, the leadership of the party are essentially just completely captured by the defense industry, by the CIA and the other institutions themselves. And, you know, I think their own perceived insecurities and constantly having to prove uh, what macho tough guys they are, et cetera, like that. And of course, most of them are not at all. On the Democratic side, it's much worse. Because on the Democratic side, they're already known. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this terminology, but it's I did not make it up. I would be too embarrassed to. But they do call it this. It's the mommy party and the daddy party. And the Democrats are the mommy party. They're the ones who take care of you and make sure you're fed and, and in bed and, and you're tucked in safe and warm at night and whatever, while the daddy party is out there doing the tough guy stuff to keep you safe and to keep capitalism going so you can eat and whatever these kinds of things. These are very general takes on American politics, you understand, but it's the take. And so what does that mean though? It means that the Democrats are weak. It means they're socialists, if not communists. It means that, you know, they're uh, at least gay, if not trans, right? And they're, they're just a bunch of weak links and they would never defend us in a good fight. And so then if you're a Democrat, then that means you gotta act super tough all the time. You can never like, you know, accentuate the good part of that narrative and say, that's right. We're less worse than the Republicans on war. Vote Democrat. We're less likely to get you into a foreign conflict or something. That's a, a selling point, but they don't think so. In Washington, DC, it's not a selling point. Out here in the country, that might be the only thing that we like about the Democrats is they are presumably a little bit less dangerous on foreign policy. Um, although I don't know anybody believes that anymore, but that was the narrative from Vietnam up until a couple of years ago, at least. Um, but, you know, Hillary Clinton is the ultimate example of this, of course, because she's not just a Democrat, but she's also a woman. And so she and she's just completely two dimensional in her thinking on this. Right. Again. Um, you know, they call it calculus, but it's just arithmetic. It is basic, stupid stuff. Well, if women are not as strong as men, and if Democrats are not as strong as Republicans, then I guess I better start a war against Libya. So everybody knows I mean business. And then, and then that's the policy. And that is why she did it. And you can read it in the emails that, you know, all of her advisors said, this is great. It makes you look so tough. It may, this is smart power at its best. And you're going to be able to run on this in 2016 as the victor of the Libyan war. When she crowed and said, we came, we saw, he died. Quoting Julius Caesar, that was a practiced line. It's in the email. Sidney Blumenthal told her, you better have a practiced line ready to go for when Gaddafi is killed. You have something to say. This is going to go down in history as your memorable moment. You're the successful leader who started this war and it's going on your permanent record. Now, of course, by the time she ran in 2016, it was like, shh, we don't want to talk about Libya at all. Of course, it's a complete catastrophe. <laughs> 10,000 people drown in the Mediterranean Sea, literal chattel slavery, where even CNN admits that you can buy a human being for $400 in the aftermath of that regime change, and they buried the thing. But you see, the, again, what they call the calculus, the simple arithmetic. If you look weak, you have to act extra tough, right? And then what do the Republicans do? The Republicans just double and accentuate that. And they say, that's right. Democrats are weak. Democrats are pathetic. Democrats are feminine. Democrats aren't man enough to get the job done. And then so what does that do to the dynamics in D.C.? It means that there's nobody who stands for America first. Ron Paul is at, retired doing the Liberty Report, um, you know, back home in Galveston. The um, the you know, there there's Rand Paul and Mike Lee and a few, you know, Thomas Massey and a few others 
are, are pretty good on the Republican side. And there are a few Democrats who are OK on foreign policy. But for the most part, all of them, and including Rand Paul, are terrified of being called weak. You know, Donald Trump was the same way. We saw the exact same dynamic, the way that the military forced Obama to do the Afghanistan surge and the way that the military forced Trump to do his own Afghanistan surge. It was a much smaller one, but still it killed tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people, a massively escalated air war. It was a war which Trump wanted to end from the very beginning. As soon as he came into power, he said, I want out of Afghanistan. And they told him, no way. And you know what they did? They said, we're going to call you weak, like Obama. In fact, they said this themselves, Tillerson and Mattis, the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense, they told this to Bob Woodward. They said, we had a policy. It was called scaring the shit out of the president. That was the name of the policy. And here's how we would do it. We would say, Mr. Trump, if you do this, you'll look weak like Obama. And we will tell the public that you're weak like Obama. And anything bad that happens in Afghanistan, we're going to blame it all on you. And I get you guys have seen that right now. That's what they did to Biden, too. If we if you order a pullout and it looks ugly on the way out, we're going to blame it all on you. And so Barack Obama and Donald Trump both curled up at their feet. Oh, just don't call me weak. And did whatever they said. And Biden was actually the only one who was man enough to stand up to them on uh, Afghanistan. And that was actually only because he would have had to triple the war. He would have had to send tens of thousands of more troops back into the country and re-escalate the whole damn thing if he was going to hang on to it at all. And he wasn't willing to do that. I don't know if Trump would have stuck by his guns or whether he, whether he would have given in. It was his peace deal. Um, but that's the way the dynamic works. And so here's us the civilians of America, not just the libertarians, but just the civilian population of this country stuck between a bunch of hawks and a bunch of hawks. And there's nobody speaking reason here. There's nobody who's just saying we should not be doing this. And so it persists. And so here we are in 2022, and we're literally closer to a nuclear war with Russia than we have been at any time since 1962 and the Cuban Missile Crisis when it just should not be this way at all, when we could have a completely friendly and productive uh, and cooperative relationship with Russia, where we don't have to have a military alliance in Europe whatsoever, much less extend it all the way to their border. And it's not a utopian view. I mean, frankly, you just have to take the post-Cold War world that was gifted to these men in our regime. And then all you have to do is just make the right choices instead of the wrong ones. And it, none of this would ever happen. Just like in the Middle East, we could have had an entire 21st century without Middle Eastern wars at all. You know, the Taliban would have negotiated over bin Laden. They wanted to negotiate over bin Laden. We didn't even have to invade Afghanistan, much less Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, Mali, and Chad, and Sierra Leone, and Burkina Faso, and Niger, and Nigeria, and all of that. None of that had to happen at all. None of it. Same thing here. Bill Clinton, he didn't have to expand NATO into Eastern Europe. He could have abolished NATO. And so we don't need it at all. You know, America's supposed to be a limited republic, not a world empire. They said we only needed NATO because of the emergency of world communism. But once world communism went out of business 30 years ago, then the American empire could have and should have too. And we wouldn't be in this mess at all. Now our task is figuring out how, how to get out of this hole that they have dug for us. Sure is a hell of a time to bring up abolishing NATO altogether and coming home right when Putin's holding a gun to our head and, and that's what he wants. And he's in the middle of launching this aggressive war, which obviously I understand makes all of my arguments about just how bad the Americans have been this whole time in the time leading up to it pretty much moot since he's the one killing thousands of people now. Um, you know, it certainly makes the Russian position look very bad, um, you know, for the rest of the rest Western world for the foreseeable future here. Um, I, I have trouble imagining how we're ever going to get out of this unless we were to elect somebody like Rand Paul, who would be willing to just say, I am absolutely making a break with the past. I don't give a 
damn about Bill Clinton and W. Bush and Barack Obama and Donald Trump and Joe Biden and what they said. I don't give a damn what treaties they tore up. I don't give a damn what threats they made or what promises they made. It's a brand new day in America. This is our policy now. And if anybody thinks we're backing down to Putin, you're crazy. I'm the son of Ron Paul. I've always wanted out of NATO. Everybody knows that, et cetera, like that. That's how it would have to be. It would have to be the American people elected someone on the basis of absolutely rejecting this foreign policy. And you saw what they did to Donald Trump. I mean, think about this. The secret police framed a major party candidate for president for treason. And then when he won anyway, they kept it up anyway. And they continued to pretend to investigate him for years. And the Israelis call this chutzpah. Um, there's no other like real word in English for it. The amount of, uh, you know, uh, cynical courage that it takes, right, to take that kind of position the way that they do. So anyway, it's going to take something miraculous for things to change in the narrative here. For a president to come to power willing to say, I want to get along with Russia. The American people elected me to get along with Russia. And, and I don't give a damn what the FBI and the CIA about it. We're going to get it done. And it would and it would take a consensus of the American people behind him, too. Which, by the way, the American people did elect Donald Trump, who ran on getting along with Russia. For all we know, that's why the American people elected him. It was one of the main reasons, one of the main things he ran on. It was certainly no secret. And they were already calling him a traitor and a treasonous puppet of Russia before the election ever happened. And the American people elected him anyway. Could be that by huge margins, they agree that we should not be doing this. That we just happen to live in a world where Bill Clinton and W. Bush and Barack Obama and Donald Trump and, um, and well, and up to then, uh, uh, Barack Obama had made bad decisions. And we want them unmade. Um, it's not much of a stretch. Hell, that's how Obama got elected is people thought that W. Bush had made bad decisions. Hell, that's how W. Bush got elected. He said we should have a humble foreign policy. Bill Clinton is too adventurous, taking over the whole damn world out there. We shouldn't be involved in nation building. We shouldn't be involved in all this adventurism. That's part of how W. Bush was, got elected, was against Clintonian intervention. And of course, Obama got elected as supposedly the antidote to what Bush had just done for eight years. And then as you guys know, Trump was elected as the anti-Obama. And, and all these guys have in common is horrible, adventurous foreign policies and you know paper money policies. So, and those things go together as well. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, I should have like written a great sentence to wrap up with. Um, that's why, um, this is mostly our government's fault. And that's why the burden is truly on us to change the narrative in our society and how people understand these issues so that we can change the policy toward one that will be peaceful and productive for us for our future. And I'm sorry for going on for so damn long, but that's the end. Thanks guys, appreciate that. Well, thank you, Scott. I mean, I've talked to you so many times and I'm always impressed by how long we can talk uh, and how you can remember all these things. What um, was that? How long was that? I wasn't keeping count. We, what so time did we, we start? 7.30? 6.30. He's in a different time zone. Oh, yeah, that's right. 6.30 Montana time, so that would be 7.30 your time, yeah. Yeah, two and a half hours. Yeah, that's about how long it takes. Sorry. Well, Everybody can go take a bathroom break now. <laughs> well yeah i think we can we can take a few questions if, if you guys are willing to stay um yeah. i'm surprised no one left um, yeah so i, I appreciate job. that by the way i saw a couple of people get up to go to the bathroom i wasn't sure if anybody's coming back or what but i appreciate <laughs> you guys sticking through all that i hope it was interesting enough yeah so if you have any questions um i'm sure ethan to call you out i, I know you have a few things that you were thinking about uh, one, no, it, you're, a, you're a Middle Eastern specialist, and so I kind of want to tie it into maybe a topic uh, that the two have in common. Uh, I can CIA, barely hear Liam. Yeah, uh, should I, should yeah you can come up. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, tying some of, uh, of your Middle East experience to the situation here in Russia, CNN had a report today 
um, about the black hole that the weapons are going into, that there is zero fidelity or visibility um, that the US or Western powers have as to where the weapons that they're currently sending in Ukraine are actually ending up. Um, it was kind of surprising to see such an honest report like that from CNN, honestly, but refreshing nevertheless. Yeah. Um, and so do you think that there's a possibility that even if Russia accomplishes minor goals, you know, just control over some of the, the areas in the Donbass, is there a, a real threat of a sustained insurgency in Ukraine? Um, do you think that there's uh, the possibility of more widespread factional violence um, that could break out regardless of whether the, the West or Russia comes out on top in the situation? I guess yeah, that's a great question. The, the, the risk of yes. insurgency, yeah. Yes, sir. I, I think the answer to that is yes. I mean, I, you know, the Ukrainians are, some of them are very nationalistic. And again, even the Russian speaking factions in the far east of the country, they've now been invaded by Russia and seen people killed all around them and these kinds of things. So if he thought like Dick Cheney, he was going to get greeted with flowers and candy and all of this, he was wrong. And I think you're you're smart also to recognize that they seem to have really scaled back their goals to just hanging on to the Donbass. Now, that's not only the area that was already under separatist control. The greater Donbass is quite a bit bigger than that. So they still have a fight on their hands to take it all. But let's say that they take all of the Donbass, including, you know, Mariupol and all the land to Crimea, secure all those freshwater resources for the Crimean Peninsula and the rest. And then Putin says, OK, I won. I got everything that I wanted and I beat the hell out of y'all's military and degraded it in a way uh, that I'm satisfied now. And so we can stop the fighting. We'll have a ceasefire and I'll just keep the Donbass and Crimea and you guys can have the rest and whatever. I think that is, is very likely that the Ukrainian regime would continue to try to fight. And that, again, if Zelensky signed a peace deal, that the Nazis might just shoot him in the head and keep fighting anyway. Um, I don't think that he is safe from them. They have threatened to overthrow Poroshenko, his predecessor, and uh, Zelensky both numerous times, and credibly so. Again, if these Nazis aren't a problem or a threat, how come the military doesn't just go and disarm them? And the answer is because they can't. Uh, they're too powerful compared to the Ukrainian military, and the Ukrainian military is too infested with them anyway. There's just no way to do it. The best they can do, in fact, Zelensky, I don't know if you guys saw this, Brett Baer on Fox News asked Zelensky about the Azov Battalion. You can find it on Rumble, but they deleted it from the Fox News archive of the interview. I mean, it's amazing. The, the time that we live in with the censorship is just insane. So here, Brett Baer, who is Fox News' star reporter, right? Carl Cameron's gone, I think. He is their star hard news guy. Him and that, that Ka Catherine Claridge, but she, she doesn't have his weight at all, I think. Brett Baer is their most important guy. Brett Baer says, you know, Zelensky, tell me about this Azov battalion. They're said to be Nazis. And he goes, well, they are what they are. They're helping defend the country. He doesn't deny it. And then he says, you know, but don't worry, we've integrated them into our military. Right? He doesn't say we disarm them and put them in prison <laughs> or we disarm them and sent them home even, right? Uh, don't worry, we integrated them into our military. Oh, well, that's a relief. Um, you know, that there are entire actual Nazi divisions of the Ukrainian army. All right, great. Um, and then he says, and listen, some of these guys got carried away and committed some war crimes back in 2014, but we put them on trial. But the punchline there is they all got their convictions overturned and we're set free, right? So uh, no wonder they just cut this out. Of the you, you go watch the the Brett Bear interview with this guy anywhere but Rumble and you can't see this question and answer. It's just incredible that they would do that. I mean, because they're caught red-handed. It's not like people don't have DVRs. You know what I mean? It's not like you can make the internet forget that this happened. But it's just, you know, most people aren't going to see it. Most people are going to see an archive that has that question and answer excised from it, which is really incredible. But to go back to your, your question here, what happens if Putin declares victory, tries to sign a ceasefire with Kiev and or D.C. and or Berlin, whatever? I think they'll keep fighting. I think just like the war has been for the last, you know, six or eight years, they can't turn it off. They don't know how to turn it off. Um, in fact, 
you know, I don't want to, um, I don't want to sound like I'm like really piling on with Putin in his argument for why to invade the country that he needed to denazify the country. Like, yeah, there are some Nazis there. I don't think that's a reason to invade. Again, I think what he did was reason was rational, but not reasonable from any like moral point of view. Um, you know what he's done here. But part of his argument was there's a bunch of armed Hitler loving Nazis around and we're Russians. We kill Nazis. That's our job. And so we're just not going to tolerate having a bunch of Nazis on our border, threatening our people and, and killing pro-Russian and ethnic Russian forces in the far east of the country in this way. Um, and so I guess there's a possibility that they could literally succeed in denazifying the country in the sense of really smashing the Ukrainian military and getting to the point where they can identify who are the powerful Nazis and get them. Um, I think that's a lot of what's just happened in Mariupol. I think you've had a lot of the Azov battalion has been wiped out there. Um, you know, I'm sure all their most dangerous leaders are safe in the west of the country somewhere. Um, but it could be argued that Putin knows exactly what he's up against in the form of your question there, and that he's not going to declare victory until he's satisfied that Azov and Adar and C-14 and right sector and the rest have been absolutely smashed. Um, you know, and what that's going to take, I don't know. I got to tell you, again, the Biden, the Biden government keeps saying, yeah, we think this is going to take at least through the end of 2022. This war is going to last. I mean, again, they're not even trying to talk. They do not want the war to end. I swear this is true. You guys Google this up on your phone while I'm talking if you want. It's April the 5th, Washington Post. Some in NATO want to see, would prefer to see the Ukrainians continue fighting and dying than to see an early end of the war. That's the Washington Post from April 5th. It's better for the Ukrainians to keep fighting and dying than to see the war end too early. Yeah, it wasn't early end. It was see it end too early. That's the direct quote. We rather have the thing drag on. So, you know, they have, you know, if Putin's goals really are that expansive, that he's going to you know, not settle for anything less than killing, you know, what his intelligence agents say is, you know, some 85 or 90 percent of all the Nazis, you know, armed and dangerous Nazis in the country or something like that. Then he has a very willing partner in Joe Biden who's willing to arm those Nazis with all the, you know, uh, surface to surface and surface to air missiles that he can. So it could be a hell of a bloody war. And, and look, Senator Coons who I only found this out the other day, Coons is Biden's old right-hand man. He was a staffer on Biden's staff when Biden was in the Senate back when. Um, and he's a senator on, of his own right now. And he demanded American ground troops in Ukraine. He wants American troops on the ground fighting Russians in Ukraine now. And, you know, I think that was like a trial balloon from the White House. It was their guy that said that, you know? It's like if Liam starts saying pro-war stuff to you guys, you're like, dude, did Horton tell you to say that? What's going on? You know what I mean? Like, you kind of, so, um, you know, I, I really think they want to drag this thing out. And, and, and the danger there is that this could escalate so quickly. I mean, you guys know the phrase, things can change so fast in politics. You know, in just a week or two, we could be living in a different world. Well, it's the same thing with a war. You know, you could have, again, you could have the Russians mistakenly think they're under nuclear attack. Now, on the average Tuesday, they're probably not going to panic over a false alarm. But what about if we're in the middle of a proxy war at DEFCON 2 on their border and they get a false alarm about incoming nukes? That's the kind of danger that they're playing with. Again, the entire lobby in this country, the war party lobby, pushing for a no-fly zone. But that means American Air Force and Navy jets shooting down Russian jets. And that means Russian jets shooting down American jets. And that means Americans 
bombing anti-aircraft batteries, not just in Ukraine, but inside Russia. Because again, we're not talking about a proxy war in Vietnam. We're talking about a proxy war right on Russia's border. So if we're going to control that airspace, that means we have to send in special ops guys with laser designators into Russia to take out anti-aircraft inside Russia. And that means nuclear war and we all die. That's what that means. General nuclear war. You can't, I think, you know, I don't, there are some people disagree with this, but I just don't see how we could ever have any real direct military conflict with Russia without it immediately devolving into general nuclear war. They're just not, that's the purpose of nukes is so we don't ever fight. And the idea that we could fight a conventional tank war against Russia in Ukraine, and then what, just win? And then Putin will say, sorry. And then, and then Ukraine will be sovereign again and it'll be great. And we'll just leave an American army as peacekeepers occupying the land from now on. As you guys could see, it's impossible to do that without it leading to a, a direct conflict between the United States and Russia, not just in Ukraine, but around the world and a war between us and our allies and them and theirs. And that means nukes. And you know, when they, they do the continuity of government exercises where they pretend what it would be like if we got into a war with Russia and they nuked DC and then you have the generals in Colorado Springs take over the government and all of these kinds of things. They do practice exercises all the time. And in those exercises, uh, a limited nuclear war with Russia always goes to general nuclear war. It's just, there's not, there aren't enough different nuclear war battle plans on the shelf to choose from, you know? It just doesn't make sense that, okay, well, we're going to hit a couple of their fields of nuclear silos here, and we're going to hit one of their major cities here and then hope that they stop. Nah, they don't stop. In all the war games, they don't stop. They keep hitting back, and then we keep hitting back, and they keep hitting back. And in fact, if you guys go to antiwar.com slash Scott, is the written version of this speech that I've more or less ad-libbed you for the last couple hours here. And there's an anecdote in there about Dick Cheney in 1989, when he first became the Secretary of Defense under H.W. Bush, and they showed him a simulation of what it would look like for us to have a nuclear war with Russia on the map. And their eyewitnesses say that Dick Cheney started squirming in his chair and was just so uncomfortable and freaked out by this because they showed essentially like a red dot represents any H-bomb going off over Russia, you know? And they just show America nuke Moscow over and over and over and over and over 30 times, 40 times, 50 times. And Dick Cheney says, what in the world is this? Well, how in the world could we, why would we nuke the same city two, three dozen times over? What is going on? And of course you guys know it's a government program. Nuclear war is a government program, which means that the army, the uh, Navy, the um, strategic air command in charge of the missiles and the different division in charge of the planes and the air delivered nukes, they all want to crack at the same target. And they've also wanted the same crack at the same target all along. And they keep developing new nukes. And when they develop new nukes, they just get added to the list. And they don't replace other things on the list that now get knocked off the list. So you literally have a situation where there's this one little radar station on the edge of town outside Moscow, and they're gonna nuke it 30 times with 30 hydrogen bombs. Because everybody wants two or three cracks at it, and what if it's a dud, and that's not fair that the Navy gets to hit it three times and we only get to hit it twice and whatever, and it just goes on and on and on like that. And it's just, you know, nuclear war as a government program. and. And they said that Dick Cheney like flipped out over this and, and you know tried to get them to rewrite the nuclear war plan after that. It just didn't make any sense that we do it this way. Ellsberg, Daniel Ellsberg says when he first came to power in the Kennedy administration and reviewed the war plan from the um, Eisenhower and Nixon years, there was one and only one war plan. And it said, if we get into a beef with Russia, like say for example, a crisis over Berlin, America will nuke every single city in the Soviet Union and China. And that meant all the Eastern European captive nations too. 
not just, you know, the Soviet republics, but that would have meant we nuke Warsaw and we nuke Prague and we nuke Kiev. We nuke every city in the Soviet Union and China. That was the one and only nuclear war plan on the shelf in 1961. And, they, and then Ellsberg came in and rewrote that. So, you know, the way that they, you know, it's sort of like uh, all the worst judges end up in family court. Like it's sort of a, a cul-de-sac, you know, something like that. All the worst military men end up in nukes, right? Because that's like a do nothing loser job where you sit around, you don't ever get to fight, right? It's, this is where you put the loser officers that you can't get rid of. Like a public school teacher in New York where they just get paid to like stay in that little teacher's lounge for 25 years or whatever um, without ever getting fired. You know, this is where this is this is this is who runs America's nuclear weapons policy is, you know, all the biggest losers in our military go to this dead end cul-de-sac career killer job in nuclear weapons. And that's who's in charge of sitting on them all day. Um, it's it's the most dangerous thing in the world. And 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 if you didn't have. If our if our politicians didn't have an agenda, but it was just you and you and you and me up there, and we would be doing everything we could to make sure that America's relationship with Russia stays 100% cool forever at all times, with no exceptions. There's just no other issue on the face of the earth that compares. I mean, even China, if they launched all 300 nukes at us, that would be a hell of a thing, but it wouldn't compare to a full-scale nuclear war with Russia. Um, where we have thousands and thousands and thousands of these weapons. You know, Chinese only have about 300, which is more than enough to kill our entire civilization. I don't know if it's more than enough to kill all of the world. Um, but there's just, you know, quantifiably, if you accept the premise that life matters at all, this is the single most important issue facing all of mankind for now and forever until nuclear weapons are completely abolished off the face of the earth. And it's just intolerable that we let our politicians put us in such dangerous circumstances with this kind of risk involved. Anyone else has a question for Ms. Barr? Hi, I'm Chris. And uh, I have a, first, I really like really like the presentation and I do agree with you. This will go on for potentially years for a very, very long time. And I guess my question is we're kind of here now and I do think there's some upcoming conflicts like in Pakistan and you know the Chinese and possibly in the Solomon Islands. How do we kind of act from here and now to try to disengage the nation from these kind of conflicts? Yeah, good question. I mean, this is my best idea. Guys, is I just try to tell the truth about the context of what's really going on here. And it's the same kind of thing with China. America is the world hegemon. The question with China is, is all of the Pacific Ocean and American Lake or only 99% of it? They claim only 99% of it. Um, and so it's not a question of whether China is trying to take over the world. It's a question of whether they have a sphere of influence at all. Same thing with Russia. America denies that anyone else is allowed to have a sphere of influence. Only we are, and ours is the entire sphere. Um, and everybody else better just, you know, get used to it. So, you know, when it comes to China, they are certainly more aggressive under their current leadership. There's a possibility that they would attack uh, and reincorporate Taiwan, although I think that's doubtful. Um, there's at least a possibility there. Um, the thing with the Solomon Islands, I think, is overblown. You know, again, I thought it was hilarious um, with all this talk about, well, Ukraine has the right to join any military alliance they want. And then, yeah, the exact same people who say that were on Twitter a couple of weeks ago talking about maybe Australia should launch a preemptive war against the Solomon Islands to do a regime change against their government there for wanting to sign this deal with the Chinese. Uh, because of course the Solomon Islands don't have the right to join any military alliance they want, do they? Not if a major power nearby has anything to say about it, they don't. Um, same thing uh, for us in Canada and Mexico, same thing for Russia and Ukraine, same thing for Australia and the Solomon Islands. Now, whether that really comes to a head or not, I'm not really sure, but 
I mean, honestly, I think the answer is just to constantly argue as harshly as we can or strongly as we can for non-interventionism and just try to show people, you know, just how destructive all this can be and, and try to, you know, like I've done tonight, try to show that this is not a partisan attack. You know what I mean? It's, it's not an anti-American attack. I'm from here. And it's not a Republican or a Democrat attack because I'm not either. And you can see that out of the presidents, it's Bill Clinton and W. Bush I hate the most. And, and so it's not a, a Republican Democrat thing. It's just uh, those are the actually worst presidents of my lifetime. And it's the things that they did that made me hate them so damn much. But it's, I don't, I don't pull punches for Obama or Trump or Biden or anybody else either. Um, you know what I mean? I'll give them credit where they deserve it and I'll, I'll slam them uh, when they deserve that. But it's just the truth. It's the context that people need to know. And, you know, my speech that I gave in Utah, it's the same speech, but just all written out. Um, I gave in Utah back in February. And the whole thing written out was like 50,000 words or something. And my boss at antiwar.com was all mad at me because it's just, I mean, it's ridiculous for to ask anybody to sit still for two and a half hours to hear a speech. I think it runs two hours when it's when I when I just read it, it's only two hours. You guys get the long version with all the extra tangents um, and the and the uh, distractions. But um, my boss, Eric, he goes, no one's going to read that. And look, he's been the boss at antiwar.com for a long time. He knows what's get what gets clicked on and what doesn't. He goes, nobody's going to read this 50,000 word article, dude. This is just a waste of time. Fine, I'll run it. But that got the most traffic of all the articles on antiwar.com that week. It got, I forgot how many, tens of thousands of clicks on it or more than 100,000, whatever it was. Uh, people read that thing because it was called the history behind the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And people just know that there's more to it than what they're being told. Um, you know, a history behind it, huh? Okay, I'm game. And then you had people, a lot of people who had never heard of me, who aren't libertarians, who aren't interested in coming at this from um, any particular point of view other than just being a regular American and being interested in it. And then they were all kind of blown away by it. And, you know, it would be fair if you go, yeah, but Scott, you're such an anti-government guy and you hate the U.S. government so much. That's what you're always going to say no matter what and all that. You're right about that. Like, I admit that. That's true. And yet you also got to admit I make a lot of really great points. And in, the, and in the written version, I got a lot of great block quotes that you just can't mess with. You know, when Bill Clinton's Secretary of Defense blames himself to this day because he didn't resign. He's not just mad that he didn't resign. He's mad because he feels like America's entire relationship with Russia went off on the wrong tangent because he didn't resign. So in other words, he blames himself for this entire mess. That's William Perry, the most thoughtful guy that ever worked for Bill Clinton in the 90s. You know, he was not a politician. He rose up from the bowels of the Pentagon, where he was the wonkiest civilian wonk to ever work at the Pentagon. And they made him the Secretary of Defense. And he almost resigned over NATO expansion. And in his memoirs, he's just cursing himself and says, if only he had done it, if only he had resigned, that would have stopped Bill Clinton from doing it. And he thought, well, he'll just stay on the inside and try to affect the policy from the inside. Oh, what an error. You know, so with those kind of quotes, you just can't mess with that. It's just true. It's a look. The fact that that uh, Kennan predicted it and that Perry laments it just means I'm right. That's it. The question is, just the same as when Ron Paul took on Giuliani about the cause of September 11th. It was because we were bombing bases. We were bombing Iraq from bases in Saudi Arabia. That's what it was about. And, and that's it. And you know what? That made people fall in love with Ron Paul, by the way. He fed them the most bitterest pill of all. George Bush told us they hate us because of how cool we are. You're telling us now they hate us because of what a devil Bill Clinton is? And that was a bitter pill because, you know, of course, Ron Paul doesn't say politicians names. He's not personal. So he didn't say Bill Clinton. It was we. He was a congressman. He talked in the royal we. The United States government did this, you know, caused this to happen. That was a really bitter pill for the American people to swallow. But something like 20 million of us 
immediately, well, I already love the guy anyway, but 20 million a you immediately fell in love with the guy because look, he's honest enough to tell me the truth. This politician respects me enough to tell me the truth that he would have to guess I don't want to hear. Cool. I can respect that is how people responded to that. So, and Ron Paul's the one who taught me this. This is the task. Tell the truth. Educate the people. You know, we're never going to get the people to do the right thing unless they know what the right thing is, unless they have the principles, unless they have the knowledge to make the right choice. As Ron Paul put it to me 18 years ago, he said, listen, we didn't know that the Soviet Union was going to fall apart. We thought the Soviet Union would last for the rest of our lifetimes anyway. I mean, we knew that its collapse was inevitable because we know Austrian school economics, but still it was a huge and powerful empire with tons of resources at their, you know, access. And then the whole thing just fell apart because the people of the Soviet Union, even in a totalitarian communist state, the people get the government that they demand. The, or at least the government that they refuse to support cannot stand. And so we don't know what's going to happen, whether there's going to be three more wars or four more. Uh, we don't know if the American empire is going to completely disintegrate like the Soviet Union, what it would look like if that began to happen. Um, you know, we don't know if, if Rand Paul actually might become the president next time and start doing the right thing or any of that. But what we do know is the truth and we know about liberty. And so we should just teach people about liberty and teach people about the truth of what our government is doing and why they don't deserve our support in doing it and just stick with that. And, you know, of course we could be creative and try to come up with, uh, you know, political actions and, and things we can do and offices we can run for and other things to try to have an effect. But overall education is the key. If we live in a country where the people just don't believe in the wars anymore, then that's it. They're over. And I know that, you know, it's true. There's studies about this. Public opinion doesn't count. It's organized and well-financed lobbying that counts in government. But there's one big exception to that, and that's war. You know, Colin Powell and Casper Weinberger had the, the Powell Doctrine after Vietnam. It was essentially the doctrine for keeping out of wars. They said, you don't go to war unless, for one thing, you know exactly what your objectives are and how to win it. And you're going to go in with overwhelming force. You're going to win the war in a very short time. And then you're going to come home because you have a smart exit strategy and all this. Huh. Um, and he said, the American people have to be united behind it. That's the lesson of Vietnam. Even if that war had been winnable, which it wasn't, it definitely could not have been winnable without the American people united behind it at home. And they weren't. Now, W. Bush said, well, screw the Powell Doctrine. I at least got the W. Bush Doctrine is at least I have the American right with me. As long as the American right wing will support the war, then screw them hippies anyway. We don't need them anyway. And he had the Democratic Party, if not the left half of the American voters and American public. But now they're losing the right. I'd like to say they've just officially lost it, but the Republican Party leadership is still so horrible on the thing. I don't want to speak too soon here. But Ron Paul really helped, you know, um, crack the door. And then Donald Trump kicked it in because Donald Trump was running against George Bush's brother. So he had to get out there and say that going to Iraq was the worst decision any president ever made. Those the Middle East wars, the worst thing anybody ever did. And this kind of hyperbole is the only way he knows how to handle it. But that's great because it meant that the American right wing were like, OK, well, if you say so and, and look. They ran with McCain and with Romney, and they lost. Donald Trump disavowed W. Bush, and he won. And that was what it was always going to take, was disavow disavowing W. Bush's legacy. And then by disavowing it, too, then he doubled and tripled that sentiment on the right. And, and this is why Tucker Carlson, who's, you know, he's pretty bad on China, but he's certainly anti-war, and he's, and he's anti-intervention on the Middle East and Europe, for sure. And... You know, he's part of that. And, and you know, he's kind of carrying that forward. And so you see on the American right less and less support for the wars. And that, to me, is the most important thing of all, is if the American people won't, well, for example, 
the, the, the American right would not follow Barack Obama as their commander in chief into Syria in 2013. They just said, hell no, we're just not doing that. Screw Barack Obama. He ain't no commander in chief of me. And they, and they had to back down. They couldn't do the war. They just didn't have the support. And, you know, it's easier, but you know what? Even for a Republican president like Trump, when Trump bombed Syria, the new right was against it. You know, most of his voters said, we should not be doing this. We don't care about that. It was kind of the old Republican Party leadership that supported it. But the the Republican voters of America were against it. And those were limited kind of engagements. And they liked the narrative that Donald Trump didn't start any new wars. And he did negotiate an end to the war in Afghanistan. He does deserve credit for that. He was absolutely horrible on the war in uh, Yemen. And he kept troops in Iraq and Syria. He backed down before... Donald Trump ordered troops out of Syria three different times and back down to the Pentagon three different times and left them in there. Um, but the sentiment is there. He really did so much to get the American right wing to get over their you know, instincts for a hawkish foreign policy. So that to me, I think is the most important thing for us to build on is that you know, if you like your identity, you can keep it. We're not asking you to move left we're not asking you to like grow your hair out and be a hippie and start smoking, you know, Mexican dirt weed. We're just asking you to get smart and stop believing in this stupid foreign policy anymore. You can still be a Republican. You can still love your dad. You can still be a Christian. You can still be a uh, conservative on abortions and immigration and whatever issues you want. It's fine. But just stop believing in this nonsense. It's just not true. And I think, you know, for libertarians, especially, this is our task is to educate the American right, because without them, the war party just can't continue on like this anymore. That's my belief. So that I think is, um, you know, Ron Paul led the way on that. And I think that that's the trail we should be continuing to try to blaze here. All right, well, thank you all for coming out and staying this late. Um, I'm, and thank you, Scott, for sticking with us. Um, but yeah, if, if anyone wants to show up to our meetings, we meet every Tuesday. We have free pizza like we did tonight. Uh, and if you're in, <laughs> sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. Um, but if you're interested in his last book and up already, uh, just talk to us and, and we can get you a copy. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming out and we hope to see you at another meeting. And thank yeah. you, Scott. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate you guys coming out, man. Thank you.